My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Beheld him. Because when they beheld him, they didn't see the world. What they saw was glory. He said, and they beheld him. And they beheld, and they beheld his glory. So many received the word, and they quote it loud. But the ones that become, the ones that are transformed, are the ones that stay beholding. Because when they behold, they don't see the word anymore, they see the glory of the word. And him that sees the glory, the Bible said, he is changed. So the betting of sons is a function of intimacy with God. Sons are those that behold continually. John chapter 1 verse 12. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. What they had was the authority to become. But the organic protocol in becoming is not based on what you received. For example, God can come and tell you, from this day, I ordain you a prophet. What have you received? The power to become a prophet. But for you to manifest as a prophet, there are definite spiritual principles and protocols you must follow. Before the organic operation of the prophetic begins to manifest in your life. So he said, as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the sons of God. But the ones that truly became the sons of God are the ones that beheld his glory. Because in 2 Corinthians 3.18 he said, as we behold him we are changed. Because a son is an offspring a son is the essence of a being transferred and brought out to manifest in another entity. So I can only be your son if your essence is transferred into me and I become a representation of your essence. And that technology in the spirit is only possible as you continually behold the Lord. So there are many people with titles who have no reflection or manifestation of the God life and the God nature. So there are very few, there are very few sons. So when you see a territory in darkness, it's because there are no sons of order. Before you begin the enterprise of preaching around, make men first. Because when sons arise, Darkness naturally run away. The Bible said concerning Jesus, after that he had waited in the presence of God for 40 days in prayer and fasting, he said he returned in the power of the Spirit. And he said that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. He said the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. So the emergence of Jesus in that territory was the deliverance of that territory. So sons bear in them the capacity to transform and to deliver a territory. But the protocol of sonship is a very rigid protocol and very few are willing to align. And that's why this morning I want to talk to you about process. The process of making sons in the kingdom. Because it's not enough for God to say it. It is enough 
when you yield to the Holy Spirit until the nature and the fullness of God is trafficked in your direction. If your family is in darkness, if your territory is in darkness, the problem is not the devil. The devil is just doing what he is made or is known to do. The problem is with you. The challenge is not with God, whether he's willing to deliver. The challenge is with you. Are you the light? Have you yielded yourself to the protocol of transformation sufficient to challenge that layer of darkness that is threatening to erode your persona in that environment? You will lament because your campus is in darkness. But it will not change anything. You will go and bring the best of preachers. It will not change anything. It is what you who are on ground become that will make the difference. At best, we come to stir you up, lift you up, and the fire of God in your spirit begins to burn. But what you do to sustain that fire until you become a burning furnace is what we translate to the deliverance of this land. You may say, when this man of God comes, things will change. Things will not change. Sorry for the bad news. Things will only change when you yield to the process and you become. That's what a Lord don't want to do. You see, God in His fullness, in His sovereignty, as powerful, as mighty as He is, He still yields to process. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, he said God commanded all the green plants and herbs to appear. And he said they appeared and God saw it and it was good. Bro, when you go to Genesis chapter 2 verse 5, the Bible said there was no green plant on the earth. Because he had not caused the dew to come upon the land because there was no man on the earth to till the ground. So God was seeing what he was seeing in the spirit. What God was looking upon was the potentials that he had created. But the manifestation of the green plant on the earth was dependent on the walking of the man that is on earth. That means the earth will never become what God declares it to be unless there is a man on this side walking it. So God declared the green plant to appear. And as far as God was concerned from the heights of the heaven, it was so. But the earth was bereaved of plant. There was no plant on the earth realm. It was bereft. Until the man showed up and began to till the ground. That was when the dew rose from the earth. And the green plant began to appear. It goes to mean that the preservation of the earth is a responsibility of the man. The man who is the son of God. The preservation of eternity is the responsibility of the man. The sustenance of the purpose of God in eternity is dependent on the man. The deliverance in your family that you are looking for is dependent on the man. Even if God brings an intervention, it will remain in the spirit until you play your part in the natural. That's what that simple scripture was revealing to us. So when the Bible said the earnest expectation of creation waited, he said he didn't say it waited for the intervention of God. Hope you know most times we pray, we pray for intervention. But the earth had enough understanding. He said the earnest expectation it waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. It was not waiting for the intervention of God because God intervened from the beginning. God intervened in Jesus Christ. It is the man that will make it happen. So if the man does not arise, the Bible said the earth will continue in travail. It will be struggling to remain until the man appears. Because deliverance is born on the shoulders of men. Intervention, as significant as it is, will translate to nothing unless sons of order arise. It is the takers of responsibility that brings to bear the intervention of God to a territory and to a system. If there are no men of, of responsibility in the corridor, even if an angel walks there every day, nothing will happen. Because the earth 
the Lord has wielded to the sons of men. The manifestation of the sons of God is one of the most significant heart cry of kingdom entities in this world. A man who has the body of kingdom, every time he prays, he prays for the manifestation of men. That's why most times, you see, we go for meetings, we are more interested in getting people to rise and stand for God. It's not about the word of knowledge calling a lot of things that does not translate to transformation. I would prefer to give 90 word of knowledge about people's callings and destinies and how to make them stand than to call their names and phone numbers. Because they will just leave the meetings if I talk about their secrets and say, wow, he's a mighty man of God. But if their destiny is revealed to them, and the ability to walk it is conferred on them, they will leave that meeting and become better than the man that ministered to them. That was why Barnabas went to bring Saul, Paul, into the kingdom. But Paul became a mightier apostle than Barnabas. Because when you commit to transforming men, you commit to their eternal destinies. When you commit to the transformation of a man, you commit to his eternal relevance with God. And that's the most significant body in the heart of a kingdom functioner. That sons will rise, that will bear the witness of God in their landscape. Without the rise of sons, a territory is doomed. Your prayers will count for nothing. So this morning, we'll look at what it takes to become a son of God. You know, when you gave your heart to to Christ, or when you receive the life of God, you became a child of God. But there's a difference between a child of God and the Son of God. There's a big difference. You know, we think when we are born again, we are sons of God. We are children of God. To become a son of God, you must follow rigid process to be transformed and become like Him. The difference between a child and a son is process. What makes you a child in the kingdom? Is the receipt of the life of God. But what makes you a son in the kingdom is the process you yield to and who you become as touching your resemblance and your apprehension of the image and the likeness of God. There are many children of God, but there are few sons of God. And you will not know the implication because you don't know a lot of things depend on you, not God. A lot of things depend on you, not God. Because God has already played his part. Why the manifestation we seek is not yet visible is because we have not played our part. Most times we call on God who has concluded his own part. When we should be calling ourselves to rise. That's why our manifestations are delayed. Have you not seen that most of the prayer you pray fasting and running vigils for long, you don't see the answer. But a man of order shows up and he says, be healed. This guy has been praying and asking God to heal him for six years. But a man of understanding shows up and then he doesn't, he doesn't say, God, heal this man. He just says, be healed. What arrogance. You will be thinking that when he comes, he will say, Lord, have mercy on my son, your servant. Lord, show mercy. You know, sometimes when we go to pray, Lord, have mercy. And we think what we are doing is what we cause God to move. Your action can't move God. The only thing that moves God is the sacrifice of Jesus. <laughs> Say, Lord, move now. He won't move, sir. <laughs> because you don't command the king. Even when we say Holy Ghost, move, is for the lack of words. You don't command the Holy Spirit, brother. God has moved already. It is you putting your faith to work that makes a difference. So the prayer for healing you were praying for one year. Somebody else shows up and says, be healed. He doesn't consult with God. That's his son. When sons arise, deliverance is imminent. There are few sons on the landscape. And when sons fall, the earth plunges into darkness. When sons arise, deliverance is imminent. But when sons fall, the earth plunges into darkness. You know, Adam did not know that his fall had more implication. The fall of Adam alone caused a total and everlasting ripple effect on this side of the divide. 
It was the fall of Adam that made man to fall short of the glory of God. This morning I'm just trying to teach basic things. So I'm, I'm trying to be calm. Alright? So that you will hear this thing again and again and it will sink into your spirit. If I begin to fly, there are many things I will not emphasize. I've, I've come to learn that the most important thing is transformation. The most important thing. In my own understanding of the things of God. Adam did not know that his fall was going to create a time-based effect on the earth and on everything that is on the earth. Because he didn't understand the implication of sonship. You know, when you take sonship for granted, you lose everything. He didn't understand the implication of sonship. He thinks sonship is just um, just any other thing. Like getting what you want when you want it. Somebody say, is it on my mouth? I will say what I want to say. Don't I have the freedom of speech? You don't know the implication of sonship. Jesus said, every idle word you speak, you will account for it. So it's your mouth. You have the freedom of speech, but you are only allowed to speak, to speak the mind of God. Because what you say has a direct implication of, on you, and it also has a direct implication on your environment. So it is selfishness for you to want to say what you feel like saying at all times. And it's because you have no understanding of the weight, the scope, and the body of sonship. When Adam fell, mankind fell from glory. When Adam fell, the earth fell. When Adam fell, a new government was instituted on the earth realm. When Adam fell, new laws were instituted on the earth realm. When Adam fell, new possibilities were obtainable on the earth realm. Because of just one man's action. It was the fall of Adam that brought about the law of sin and death. When a son falls, his fall can activate a negative law. The fall of Adam gave rise to the law of sin and death. That's how grievous the fall of a son is. You think uh, it's about your appetite. The guy is troubling me. He wouldn't let me rest. And then he bought you some gifts that you will not remember at the end of the semester. And then for that, you throw your body at him. You are foolish. You don't know what it will cost. It will set a law in motion in your future. There are many things you will never be able to enter unless you pay certain prices to purge your soul. There are some things you do now. It will make difficult certain possibilities in your future. There are many. You know, I learned a lot of things by experience. One day the Holy Ghost whispered to my heart. He said, there are certain things you will not see in your life unless your soul is perpetually ascended. There are some people who don't need to pray. They can just show up and do like this and the anointing will move. Maybe they were raised in a godly home so their soul was not tampered with. But some of us, <laughs> we, have, we have learned a lot of things on account of the fall. So we need to pray and fast for a long time for our soul to be able to conduct the anointing. Not because our fasting and prayer pays the price for the anointing, but it's the price we will pay for our soul to be able to respond to the anointing. There are many people today that just wake up in the morning and they are seeing visions. As they are walking like this, they are seeing. Even before they knew they were prophets, they were already seeing visions. But there are many others that we fast and pray for 10 years before they begin to walk in the prophetic. You know why? They expose their soul to iniquity. So before they touch certain things, the energy level where those things work, because of the sin they committed, their soul went down. It will take so much effort for their soul to ascend to the energy level where the prophetic anointing operates. So the fall of a son he sets laws in motion. And one of the law is the law of sin and death. The fall of a son it activates certain possibilities. There was nothing like sickness. It was the fall of Adam 
that allowed that reality called sickness to become a possibility in this world. There was nothing like death. It was the fall of Adam that allowed that reality to find expression. You know, as a child of God, you cannot be cursed because you are blessed. But curses run on certain kinds of iniquity. So when you commit certain kinds of sin, because of that sin you are committing, a curse will be running on the frequency of that sin. So you are a blessed man, but you will be walking under the effect of that curse because of the iniquity you carry on your shoulder. The fall of a son activates possibilities. You know, we are favored. But you will go to places you will be rejected. Because rejection works at an energy level. And that energy level resonates with certain kinds of sins. So there are certain attitudes and sins that you give yourself to. That will make it possible for rejection to travel with you. Even though you are the child of God. And then you are praying for intervention. God has already intervened because you are blessed and you are favored. But you need to take the responsibility of becoming like God to be able to work at an energy level where rejection cannot operate upon. These are the organic dimensions of our work with God. So you don't know why the things that are happening to the unbelievers are happening to you. The unbelievers work at an energy level. You are also working at that energy level. When they lie, you are lying. They fornicate, you are fornicating. Yes, you are a blessed man, but there are sins, there are sicknesses, there are causes that work on the frequency of fornication. So, so long as you are still working in fornication, you are operating at a frequency. You know, you can't be on FM 97 and not hear the news. When you tune to a frequency, the things that are being trafficked, you will see it. The reason we are not seeing television signals is because we are not connected to television waves. The moment we connect to that frequency, we cannot but see the pictures. As we are here like this, if we tweak to a frequency, we can begin to watch the replay of Champions League Finals. Because it's playing right now on the frequency. There's a channel playing it now. If you tune to that channel, you begin to watch it. So even though you are blessed and you are the child of God, there's a frequency where if you keep running, the possibilities of death the possibilities of sickness, the possibilities of causes will travel with you because you are walking at a frequency. That is why most of our prayers is a waste of energy because we have not yielded ourselves to the protocol of transformation. The fall of a son, it activates spiritual possibilities in the negative the fall of a son opens his system to corruption. His system. Most of us, the reason our families are living in perpetual bondage, poverty, sicknesses, is because there were certain things we did that allowed principalities to have authority over those systems. You know, principalities. I've done a teaching already on um, civilization of spirits or technology of spirit civilization principalities the word principality simply means a prince without a territory prince a polity is a principal being but has no territory it's ancient English so the the obsession of a principality is to look for a dwelling place where he can rule and exercise his dominion when you allow certain operation of darkness in your life you open the gate for the government and the authority of those fallen princes to begin to rule. That was why the serpent was in the garden, but he was inconsequential. Because that realm was sealed from his authority. But the moment Adam opened it up by iniquity, what happened is that the authority of the serpent was superimposed in that those days in the place of prayer they brought one lady that was mad <laughs> and one of our guys you know most of us we pray so because we are all praying for 10 hours <laughs> if you don't understand the laws of the spirit you will enjoy yourself <laughs> we are all praying for 10 hours so we call we think stature is the energy with which you can pray for long 
So some of these guys that pray for 10 hours, when they hold the mic, they'll be walking like this. You know what they are doing? When you are praying, you are charging. They'll just look at you. they say, don't worry. Let's go for two hours first. That's when we'll know who is who. So when they pray, after two hours, you'll discover naturally that those who are not people of prayer, they are tired. Some are sleeping. Then maybe you remain like 15. And then the person praying, he will open his eye and look. Let's go another two hours. Him, he knows that it's when he has reached six hours that he begins to charge. So, that, in that prayer, that prayer becomes a window for the showcase of pride. So, everything he's doing is an enterprise in the flesh. He will not touch a cord in the realm of the spirit. Prayer has become a means for strengthening his flesh. The prayer that was designed to cause him to rise in faith and in the spirit. But because he doesn't understand how the realm operates, prayer, which is a very spiritual substance and spiritual technology, have become a system for strengthening his flesh. So, oh, oh, oh. they now brought one mad girl. People were not around, so the people around him, ten- he said, the girl was violent. He said, they should keep her there first. He's doing something. The demons, they are struggling with like this. Ah, he said, this will, this will. go and pray, go and pray, go and pray. Go and pray. <laughs> when he was done with what he was doing, now came. He came to, you know, when people are around, when people are around, <laughs> if God has not helped you, you will not know that everything we do, we do by the economy of mercy. A guy now came to the lady. He stood from afar. He looked at her like this. He came. And he closed his eye, placed his hand on the lady. Say, you devil. He spoke in tongues. You devil. Before he said, come out. He had boab on his cheek. <laughs> oh my God. See, this morning I'm not here to preach. I want to show you some things that your life will depend on forever. You devil, pour up on his cheek. The guy almost fell down. When he got up, he couldn't hold himself. He came back and laughed. <laughs> he gave the girl a terrible slap. <laughs> then immediately we understood that spirituality is not a function of how long you can pray. Is the degree that God is walked into your vessel. Because the activities that we engage in the spirit that are supposed to make us, they can become a vent through which demons can manipulate us. So the lady that leads worship every day, the Sunday she's supposed to lead worship, then she'll make a long hair. As she's worshiping, she'll do like this. She'll do like this. She's flaunting the hair. It's an enterprise in the flesh. She thinks she's doing something. She's not worshiping God. She's attracting indignation on herself. Because that place she's standing is an office. And that office she's standing, it makes her visible in the realm of the spirit. And if she doesn't have the covering of the Holy Ghost in the spirit realm, the principalities will ask, by what means did you break through the portals of the divide? Who gave you access? Because the earth is in the habitation of cruelty. This world is covered by a canopy of darkness. Every time you puncture through that canopy of darkness, either in prayer or worship, your greatest security is the Holy Ghost that provides you shield. So when God gives you opportunity and your soul ascends, and you break through that canopy, and then you begin to display flesh, then the princes will come and say, how did you get here? So the lady finished worshipping, and she doesn't know why it's after every hot program that she goes back and falls into immorality. She was exposed. She entered an office, and she didn't yield to the government of the Holy Spirit. So when God helped her to ascend, she became a being of herself. And then the covering of God detached. Another prince comes upon her. You don't know why most people... It's after a mighty meeting where God moves that they go to fall into immorality. They go to fall into sin. They have not been walked upon. The salvation of this world is dependent on the quality of our sonship. The earth and the fall of a son, they are tied together. Your calling, your destiny, your authority and your ordination is tied to the quality of your sonship. Before you go about telling everybody you are an evangelist, 
learn the ways of God first. That's why Jesus said he called them to be with him that he might send them. Because that thing you call a calling may become your grave if you do it in the flesh. You need covering, you need empowerment. The protocol of sonship. I need to finish before 12 this morning because in the evening I will come here with the rod of fire. <laughs> I will come here with the rod of fire to teach in the evening. So um, we need to finish on time so that we can put ourselves together for the evening service. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus was a child. He didn't just become the, became the Messiah because he was the son of God. When he was a child, all he could do was to be a carpenter. That was all he could do. So he was popular. He was famed as a carpenter. He had skills for cutting chairs and furniture. So they knew him as the famous carpenter. The famous. That was why even when the manifestation was strong, they said, ah, is this not a is this not the carpenter? Is this not the carpenter? <laughs> to become a son, you must yield to the corridor of process. The Bible said in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 24, he said, And the child Jesus, he grew, he grew and waxed strong in the spirit. He grew and waxed strong in the spirit. If you check your life for the past two years that you started worshipping God, maybe you are a fellowship president. Maybe you have been growing in fame as a fellowship secretary or a fellowship um, president. But Jesus' growth was not calculated on the economy of his title. His growth was judged on the operation of the spirit within. The Bible said he grew and he waxed strong in spirit. That's the standard procedure. In Luke 180, concerning John, the Bible said the child grew and what? Waxed strong in spirit. If there is anything you need to do to cause your spirit man to grow, do it. Because your whole life will depend on it. The child grew and waxed strong in the spirit. That was the summary of Jesus' life. He was a man of perpetual growth. And the reason he kept growing was because he yielded himself to process. You will hear how that the Bible will say Jesus was driven into the wilderness. Yes, Luke said he was led. But Matthew said he was driven into the wilderness. He was driven. So he grew to a point where the Holy Ghost was the strongest force on his inside. That's when even when you want to marry You had your specification about the woman Tall Pencil nose Elegant Long legs And then when the time comes Because the Holy Ghost has become strong Then the Holy Ghost will say Is this person And then when you, you say thank God Finally God has revealed his choice And then you turn And you see black Short Flat nose <laughs> the child did what? He grew and he worked strong in the spirit. See, when we begin to unveil these things, then you discover that many of us are not spiritual. We are very carnal people. If I begin to preach here now, many people will not be able to sit down. You will see people, hey, hey, oh boy. And then you think because you are doing like this, you are spiritual. You are just joking. <laughs> you know, most times I deliberately calm down so that I can show people the things that made us. You will not understand. When you graduate from school and then all your dream you want to be an officer in the army, and then finally the appointment letter shows up, and the Holy Ghost says not the, that's not the way. That's when you know the difference between doctrine and experience. The difference between doctrine and experience is couched in the instructions of the Holy Ghost. 
When you graduate for nine years and God says stay here, and then you are praying, and then He doesn't say anything, and then you now say, okay, maybe I've, I've gotten what I'm looking for, and then you explain some visions to yourself, and when you pack your bag to leave, then He shows up and says stay still. That's when you will know the difference between doctrine and experience. You know, most of us think we are spiritual. I left the university in 2011. And I said, the word is about to hear me. The word. Hey, the word is about to hear me. Those days when we speak, every line you will need to write it. Because we were proud. Knowledge, knowledge was our thing. You will read all the books of Miles Moreau. You read all the books of Kenneth Hagin. You read all the books of Bishop Oedeko. When you talk, you want to show people. Sometimes when we come like this, we want to show you that you know nothing. So the first ten minutes we are talking, you will not understand where we are going. You say, God, your heart will be beating. Then you say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. <laughs> those, were our, those were our fantasies. I went somewhere when I finished preaching. They called three people for testimonies. They were here. And then one came out. He said, when I heard him, I knew I have not started. I was nothing like this. I thought I was spiritual. I thought it was about knowledge. Is the experience of God. The word is epignosis. The degree to which you become like him is the proof that you know him. So nowadays, sometimes you go for a meeting, people travel from far and wide. And then when you show up, your soul is full of power. If you speak, things will happen. Then the Holy Ghost says, Come down and teach. What? You want to fly, you begin to lose your peace. Say, Come down and teach. You have understood that He is the Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead. He is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. Amen. He has risen from the dead. He is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, when you sing that song, you think it's talking about demons. The first need that will bow is your knee. That's why I say when your own obedience is complete, then you can avenge other disobedience. Demons will never bow. That's why we command them to bow. And that is why their fear of God is not a worship. The Bible said, Thou believer that the, thou believer that there's only one God. He said, Thou doest where? He said, The devil also believes and trembles. So the devil fears God, but it's not an act of worship. Because every time the devil obeys, he's commanded. He is forced to obey. But every time you, you obey, you are convicted. That's why yours is worship. So the song is not singing about demons. It first of all begins with you and I. The way of sonship. The way of sonship. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead. He is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those days, I used to think before I can move in power. After I prayed for many hours and my soul is full of glory. And then I come, the place must be hot and the atmosphere must be, people must be scattering everywhere. Before I can move in power, I think I must labor to jack the atmosphere up. When I did that for long, the Holy Ghost now came and said, that's not the way of power. I thought it was a joke. I went for a meeting, everywhere was boiling, and I wanted to move in the power of God to heal the sick, nothing happened. I prayed for impartation, nothing happened. 
I went home. I was so, I was so weak. I felt this. I was so embarrassed. Lord, what happened? You know, it's when you feel that you remember the word Lord. <laughs> when you are shining, when you are shining, you are conscious of the shoe you wore. Sometimes you dance on the altar and do like this. But when you do everything and nothing happens, and then the people are looking like this, then you go back and kneel and say, Lord, Lord. The Holy Ghost says that's not a way of power. And I say, okay, okay, okay. Ah, every time I ascend, I used to pick songs. If I get the right song, the power of God will move. I was working with that economy. After some time, the Holy Ghost said, this is not the way of power. I thought it was a joke. I came for a meeting. Every place was boiling. I picked a song and I began to sing. And then I said, Lord. See, the way I was feeling the anointing all over me. And usually, if you understand how the anointing works, when the anointing is strong on you, as you are ministry and the anointing is growing in your heart, when it's strong, the way it is strong on you, that's how it will be strong in the beauty. At any point where it explodes in your heart, the power of God will explode in the beauty. So if you come for a meeting where your soul is full of the anointing, you can begin to minister in power immediately. And you can choose to teach until your soul ascends before you move in power. I jacked the atmosphere up and I picked the song of the Spirit. The stuff was boiling all over me. And then I began to give instructions and commands. And nothing happened. I went back and said, Lord. It's called the way of what? Sons. Lord. He is Lord. Amen. You know, some of these songs will not come to you as a revelation. Until you feel you are intelligent and then you hit a rock. In your final year, they say you have three carryovers. You will first of all think, when I come for extra year, how will I, how will I look at the people? I'm popular. Then you go back and say, Lord. That's when it will come to you as a revelation. I lifted songs and nothing happened. Cry. And I went to the Lord and said, what is the way forward? That was when the scripture in First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter ten, verse four and five, came to me as a revelation. He said, "When your own obedience is complete, then you can avenge all other disobedience." So I will come for a meeting, and then people have high expectation, and the Lord say, "Come down and just talk to them." So I will finish talking, and then the Lord will now say, "There is somebody here by the left. The person is tall, slim, and fair." Sometimes he will give me the name and say, This is what I'm doing with that person. And then when I mention it, the whole place will scatter. Wow. So I don't need to feed the anointing. When you feed the anointing, it's a plus. Enjoy it. But it's deeper than that. So I don't need to pick a song. When you pick a song, enjoy it. It's deeper than that. The key is your yieldedness to the Spirit. That's why most times you see herbalists, they just pack and go to the bush. Because the, the spirit wants to possess them completely. They wake up in the morning, the spirit is already talking to them. While they are going to sleep, the spirit is talking. So, there's no point living with men. They go and live in the forest. And the greater the power of the herbalist, the farther he is in the bush. He sucks you away from men. Is the way of consecration. The first way for the making of songs is the way of consecration. If your life is not consecrated to God, you will remain a child for a long time. An angel will appear to you and say, you are a prophet. And then you go and say, I had a graphic encounter. Light came out of the wall and the Lord spoke to me and said, I am a prophet. And then you will live for 10 years. There will be no oppression of the prophetic in your life. The worst part is that you may become a popular prophet, but without manifestation. The way of consecration. Let me show you something. How we journey in the path of consecration. When you become a child of God, you are like a servant. You see, the Bible says, we are heirs because we have become the sons of God. But in Galatians chapter 4 verse 1, it says, the heir, so long as he is a child, is not different from a servant. Though he be Lord of all. So whether you are called is not a doubt. 
Whether God is with you is not in doubt. But the thing is that the heir, so long as he's a child, is not different from a servant. Though he be what? Lord of all. He said, therefore, the father places him under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. The time appointed of the father is when the servant learns how to please the will of his master. The goal of a servant is to please the will of the master. That's why Paul said in Galatians 1 11, he said, if I please men, then I'm not the servant of God. That means the height, the crescendo, the zenith of a servant is when it comes to a point where he pleases the father. So you begin your journey from the place of a servant. You do not read about Jesus. When he started out in ministry, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And pleasing the father is a function of transformation. Jesus was not pleasing the father because he was doing a very excellent job with carpentry. Is if when you study the life of Jesus that you understood why he was able to please the father. It was Jesus that said, Behold, the prince of this world cometh to me and findeth nothing. That means all the, the trials and temptation that all of us face, they came to Jesus, but he was what? Consecrated to God. There was no part of him you could hold. Do you know why you feel lost? Because that part, that thing has not been dealt with sufficiently in you. Have you seen a remote before? You can change the decoder with the remote. You know why? There is something inside that decoder that decodes the frequency of the remote. When your concentration becomes high, everything in you that decodes the possibility and the lust of Satan begins to die. That is when you can please the will, you can please the Father sufficiently. The life of sons is the life of pleasing the Father. When you come to a point where your life can please the Father, then you graduate from being a servant. You become a disciple. So, God begins to teach you His ways. There are many Christians today that don't know the way of God. They don't know the mind of God. Everything they want to do, they must ask. That's because they are the level of servants. You are children of God, but you are the level of a servant. That's why the devil can play with your health. The devil can play with your future. He can play with your destiny. You are praying in tongues. Boo, 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 boo. After three days, dry fast. Then the devil just touch another of his servants. And say, today, dress almost naked and go and walk past his house. The girl would think she wants to use that road that money. She didn't know that the devil wants to play with you. He wants to fluctuate your emotion. So as you came out and you thought that today you are high, the first thing you saw was that lady that is an idol in your heart, almost naked. And then your soul will be punctured. Have you seen a ball that is pumped? When you puncture it, what happened? The whole prayer of diffuses. That thing you built up in three days fasting, it will what? So what God will begin to do is that He will begin to teach you His ways. That's when you understand the way of meditation. That's when you understand the way of prayer. You go to pray, it's difficult, it's so hard. The first 30 minutes is as if every thought you have in your mind, all of them are coming to you at the same time. It's as if everything you want to do is now. You want, it's as if something is pulling you to stand up from where you are praying. But because God is beginning to teach you His ways, you will know that prayer is hard, but it is the only way. So you will need there until you pray out distraction. Maybe the first three months when you are praying, you have not had any encounter. You have not known anything. You have not had any experience. What you are doing is that you are dealing with the flesh. You know the Bible says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. The key word is what? Ought and always. That means what will make you the man that God wants is what? To always pray. So prayer is what God plants in you to restore you to factory setting. But a man who has not understood the ways of God, he will spend his whole day and then when he comes back in the night, he will still go on Facebook and chat for two hours. Then when there is no energy in him anymore, then he will say, Oh, Father, I love you. And as he's saying, I love you, he sleeps off. 
He doesn't know that his life depends on prayer. He will be on Facebook until he is 35 or she is 35. When she wants to marry, then she comes and begins to find the will of God. They say there's a prophet in Lagos. She's in front there and say, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Christ hear us. <laughs> the will of God is meant for disciples. Disciples are the ones that follow. They follow. They follow. If Jesus said it's this way, they follow. Even when they are not perfect, they keep following and learning the ways of God. Learning the ways of God. So Jesus raised 12 men and they followed him for three years. Do you know what three years is? See what you experience at the height of the service. Sometimes it lasts for 10 minutes. You know, the service can be going on and it will take time before we break into the spirit. And then, most times, depending on the skill and the stature of the minister, the spirit realm can be open for you for 20 minutes. And then people are receiving directly from God. At that time, it's not even his words anymore. That thing you experience in that service, that you come once in seven days. And meanwhile, seven days is 168 hours. And then maybe you have that experience for 20 minutes every, every, every 168 hours. The disciples were having that experience every day for 300, for three years. Because they were in the presence of Jesus. They were experiencing his fullness. And they walked with him like that for three years as disciples. Anything they say, God speaks immediately. Imagine if you are somewhere that anything you think about the Holy Ghost answer you. Anything you say, the Holy Ghost answer you. That was the experience the disciples had. Jesus said, Lazarus sleepeth. Let's go to him. They now say, ah, if Lazarus is sleeping, he will wake up now. It's not like they are asking Jesus. But because they are speaking in their foolishness, Jesus answers them and says, no, Lazarus is dead. So imagine when you are just thinking and then God is speaking with you and answering you. That was the experience they had for three years in order to become disciples. Jesus said, okay, let's go. Thomas now said, let's go and die with him. You see how they were thinking? These guys were daft about spiritual things. He said, Lazarus is dead. Let's go to him. He said, he's sleeping. They said, if you sleep, wake him. Let's, he should wake up now. Why would we go? <laughs> Jesus said, okay, he's dead. He now said, okay, let's go and die with him. At least some of us have passed that level. See the way they were thinking. They knew nothing about God. That's why they needed to be disciples. In discipleship, God will teach you the way of the presence. That's when God will trouble your heart to fast, to pray, to intercede, to mingle with the believers. Because he wants you to stay perpetually in the presence. Discipleship is not following a man. Discipleship is the ability to encounter the presence. Because it's from the presence that the instructions of your life is shot into your destiny. It's the way of sonship. If you have never been discipled, you can never be a son. Men will help you. Men will lead you. Men will show you how. But until you touch the spirit realm for yourself, you can never be discipled. And a man who is not discipled can never be a son. He doesn't even know what it means. You go every day, they are praying, Lord, give me car. Tomorrow, Lord, give me husband. Tomorrow, God, give me wife. Tomorrow, God, give me money. They think it's all about what they can receive from God. They don't understand that they were not created to receive. They were created to give. That was why before they were created, everything they needed was already in the garden. You have need because you are in a falling world. But when you begin to grow, you receive dominion to conquer your world. So you are here to change the world and to improve it. But these ones will perpetually remain slaves because they don't understand the way of sonship. A son is one who has been discipled. Tell your neighbor. A son is one who has been discipled. Some of you who were born prophets from your mother's womb, if you are not discipled, you will never be a son. You will never. Because you can't even understand what it means. That's why you see many children on the altar. The prophet will wake up today. Let's not talk about it. It's pathetic. When you graduate from being a disciple, when you have known the ways of God, then you come to another level of relationship. That level is called a friend. Jesus said, 
in John chapter 15 verse 11 he said you are no more servants you have become my friends he said therefore you know the secrets of the kingdom a disciple learns the ways of God but a friend has access to the secrets of the kingdom you will know it's important to pray it's important to fast you will know it is designed for your transformation but when you become a friend then through prayer you can begin to enter into chambers in heaven and then you download things your life becomes a mystery people can't explain how you do the things you do you just come somewhere and then you talk or you wave at people and things happen hope you know some men, some men are carriers of spiritual possibilities if they just come around you things happen they are carriers of secrets they know what to do for the rain not to fall those ones are friends of God they don't just know the way of God they don't just know the mind of God they know how to break into heaven and to download possibilities you must travel through all of this corridor before you become a son God will bring you into inheritances bit by bit bit by bit pleasing the father is a heritage we have with God knowing the ways of the father is a heritage we have with God because it's in knowing the ways of the father that we can do his will and then knowing the secrets of the kingdom is the heritage that we have with God. It is on the strength of that that we can become masters over the elements of this world. A man who is captured by the devil doesn't know secrets. If anything begins to attack you, you know what to do. If somebody is troubled, you know what to do. You are not just somebody who crams certain scriptures and you come to speak. Three people can be demonized. You will come to one. You will rebuke the devil. You come to the other one, you will blow on that one. You come to the other one, you touch. All of them will be delivered. You are walking by secrets. Because all of them encountered the devil in different ways. And it has different effects on their soul. So you need different systems and technologies in the spirit to address all of those things. You can come to a place and they say the atmosphere is dry. You know how to hear the voice of God in a dry land. They say the place is hard. Things can't happen. You can come there and the power of God begins to move before you talk. Because you are a friend. Secrets are revealed to friends. If you don't know the secrets of the kingdom, it's because they are not a friend of God. It is the way of sons. These are the things that consecration affords you. You begin to grow with God gradually. And it is in your understanding of secrets and mysteries that your authority lies. The Bible said to Job in Job 38 verse 4 and verse 7 when Job was lamenting against God he said declare now if you have understanding. That means your authority in the kingdom is a function of your understanding. So a man without secret is a man without authority. You want to wield authority in the kingdom you must have access to secret. And for you to have access to secret you must travel with God until you become a friend. Because God reveals his secrets to his friends. And finally, when you grow beyond that level, then you become a son. In addition to all of these things that you have, there is something a son has that no other person has in the kingdom. It is called inheritance. A son is an heir of the kingdom. An heir of the kingdom. That means... Everything in the kingdom He has the right to it He doesn't approach things in the kingdom Because he is trying to To plead his way there He is approaching them Because he has the right to those things It is the greatest Privilege of the kingdom To be a son Because you have access to inheritance The journey Is the journey into inheritance where you can come into the fullness of God for your life. You will never get there unless you become a son. A son is one who has grown in maturity. The father can commit the kingdom to him. Many are babes and they are seeking God for eternal things. Instead of wasting your time praying for power, praying for gifts of the spirit, go and tell God to help you to learn his ways and to become like him. When you grow, you enter into heritage. Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines. 
But to Isaac, the Bible said he gave everything. Because Isaac was entitled to the inheritance. A son can walk in the nine gifts of the spirit. He doesn't need to be a prophet to flow in word of knowledge. It is inheritance. He doesn't need to be an evangelist to move in power. It is inheritance. When he comes to a place where there is need for power, he will move in power. If he comes to a place where there is need to flow in word of knowledge, he will flow in word of knowledge. Because everything in the kingdom belongs to him. If this word will be delivered, then psalms must arise. Psalms of order must arise. That's why the Bible says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. If you don't arise, everything God has may be on you, but it will make the difference. Sons must arise. The deliverance we look for is resting on the shoulders of sons. The Bible says, Saviors shall come out from Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau. Where are the sons of order today? They are scarce. We don't have sons anymore. We have many preachers. Preachers cannot change the world. We have many teachers. Teachers cannot change the world. The people God sent into the world are witnesses. Only witnesses sustain. Don't be distracted. If, well, if God is working with somebody, forget the person. These are instructions for life. It's only witnesses that will change the world. A witness is one who has the ability to carry the proofs of heaven and bring it to the earth realm. When there is darkness in the territory, a witness can come and prove that light is still a possibility. When everybody has become a liar, a witness can prove that it's possible to be a righteous man. It's possible to live a truthful life because he is a son in the kingdom. The father can commit him with responsibility. Many of us are saying, Lord, we want to serve you, but we are not yet transformed. Until you become a son, there is no inheritance for you in the kingdom. The world to come, it is the works of Jesus that will take you there. But whatever you will gain in that world is a function of your works. Reward is not a function of the finished works of Jesus. Reward is not a function of grace. Reward is a function of works. You must grow and take responsibility to be relevant with God. There are many irresponsible Christians. That's why this campus is in darkness, but not many people feel it. When they say, come, let's pray for the campus, some people say, oh boy, I beg you. When that prayer won't end, it doesn't have bodies because it's not a son. Sons are people that understand the ways of responsibility. In the Bible, everybody that was tagged and overcomer was a son. Everybody that changed the world, they were sons of order. If there is anything God wants to do in a territory that will be tangible, that thing can only be possible when there are sons. Where is the man on the keyboard? I want to fly now. Give me floating sound. This morning we are going to ask the Lord, make us sons of order. Make us sons of order. We have lived for ourselves for too long. We have lived for our appetites for too long. Most of us, the definition of our life is selfishness. Every time we dress, we dress because we want people to admire. Every time we talk, we talk because we want people to appreciate. Every time we give, we give because we want people to praise us. Our life is summarized in our selfishness. A man that lives for self is too narrow. He's too tiny. He cannot hold the possibility of eternity. You must learn to enlarge your coast and stretch forth the cuttings of your habitation. Sons of order must arise. Can we pray now and ask the Lord, make me a son. Go ahead and pray. Deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper. Deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. Our love is deeper in love. Take me deeper. Deeper in love. Jesus, 
Submit to process. Process is not a syllabus. It is the progressive instruction of the Holy Ghost that you are willing to submit to. How many are willing to make up their mind today and say, Holy Ghost, all you need to do is to whisper, I will follow. I will follow. I will follow. These are the ones that I want to hear their heart cry. They are the ones heaven wants to hear their voice this morning. They are the ones that their voice can ascend to the mountains of God. The Bible spoke of Joshua. This was the guy that followed Moses all his life. When Moses was on top of the mountain, they were celebrating. Music was going on in the camp. Joshua sat at the foot of the mountain. His curiosity did not drive him to the camp to say what is happening, what is happening when everybody are going in one direction men of process they can still stand with the Holy Ghost because they understand that is the instruction of the Holy Ghost that makes a man a point came where Joseph entered into a dimension in God that no man after him or before him ever entered into the Bible said there has never been a day like that. Neither will there ever be where God hacking to the voice of a man. A man of process had ascended to the top of Zion. The eternal God himself can hear him and hack him to his voice. He said there has never been a day like that. And there will never be. It's the way of process. Joshua develops that job with God so much that he could command the constellation. There is no man that has the power to command the constellation. It is the prerogative of God. The Bible said in Job 38 verse 31, he said, can you bind the sweet influences of pledges? Can you lose the cause of Orion? Can you summon Maserat in the season or command Actus and his son? He said, can you lift your voice to the heavens? And the cloud will bring the abundance of rain. He said, can you send the lightning? And they will say, here we are. Men don't have the power and the stature to command the constellation. But Joshua followed process until he came to a point where he developed authority with God. And he could speak to the sun. He said, let the sun stand upon the mountains of Gibeon. And let the moon remain upon the valley of Ajalon. And he said, there have never been a day like that. That's a man of process talking. That's a man that can command the constellation. That's a man that can bring deliverance to a territory. If that man shows up, even the principalities can give way. It is process that makes men in this kingdom. Take me deeper. Deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close. In your embrace, there is than I've ever been before. Oh, just want to love you more and more. Our love, deeper. 
If you have not yielded to process, you have not begun to live. Because what will make you has one name, is called process. Not many are willing. We want to live for ourselves, for our appetites, in secrecy, and then we show up as leaders in the church. The world cannot change like that. The demons that are fighting you, the principalities over those territories, they see you in the secret place. You can deceive men, but you can't deceive spirits. Until we yield to process, our soul cannot conduct the dimensions of God. Take me deeper, deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper. Deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. I want love to be deeper. Daniel and his friends were carried to Babylon. Babylon is a place of water. It's a place of demonic intelligence. Masters of witchcraft. Sorcerers and astrologers That was where they dwelt But the Bible said him and his friends They refused to define themselves With the king's meat These ones will not align with the popular thing That was happening They yielded themselves to the ways of God A day came when Even the queen of the heathen Could say concerning Daniel He said in him is the spirit Of the holy gods If the VC was to speak about you What would he say in him is the spirit of the holy gods. It's a light and an excellent wisdom was in this Daniel. When the king fell, there was no man that had stature to bring judgment. They had to look for Daniel. They went back to the cave where he was hidden. And when he showed up, he didn't need to consult with God. It was Daniel that read the handwriting. He said, Mene, Mene. Take care of a sin. A son of order, the secrets of heaven are open to him. You want to judge iniquity? You think it's a function of skill and dexterity? You don't know the powers of principalities. You think it's something you come and then because you are shouting, they will move? Your life must be poured as a drink of you. Mene, mene. It's a language that only sons understand. He said, tonight, your kingdom has been taken from you and has been divided before the babies and the patients. There is no hope for eternity unless sons are ours. This morning, I want to take a quick altar call. The business of sons. There is nobody here that the Holy Ghost has not been speaking to. Because hearing the voice of God in our dispensation is not the prayer point. The Bible said, my sheep heareth my voice. It is in following that we have a problem. But you want to make up your mind this morning and say, if God will speak again, I will follow. Some of you, the Lord, have been troubling you for the past six months. He said, stop this social media thing. Every time you want to log on, you lose your peace, but you still log on. You can never be made like that, my brother. It's not about doctrine and intelligence, it's about obedience. Some of you, God, have told you, leave that poor. Don't pick his call anymore. But there's no obedience. You want to be made in the kingdom. You need to follow the voice of God in perpetual obedience. I want to pray for the people. The first batch. I want to say, Lord, we want to yield to process today. We've seen men of God. We've gone for great meetings. But we are living in secret sins because of disobedience. But today we want to obey. Come forward, let me pray with you. Deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper. Deeper than I've ever been before. 
I just want to love you more. Oh, I want to love you I used to think great meetings are meetings where people are littered on the floor. I walked in that dimension so much. Many people called me a man of power. In the Bible school where I lectured, there was a time, a point came where if I just walk in, people begin to fall. But their lives never changed. At best, you receive healings from men. When God began to help my understanding, I realized great meetings are meetings where people make great decisions. Can you go ahead and try? You are the you are the one that knows your point of disobedience. Tell the Lord now your desire to obey. Take me deeper, deeper in love with you, Jesus. Oh, be close, your embrace. Take me deeper, deeper in love we may come for meetings and people will be littered on the floor our expectations will be met because we want to see power but if the people were not changed as it were the money was wasted the efforts were wasted because God comes for lives, not for manifestation. When I decided to yield to God, even messages I preached from meetings that I didn't research for, I just came with bodies. They go online and they travel like white fire. I came to this place around 10 p.m. I was discipling and doing Bible study online till 1 a.m. in the morning. From all around the world, pastors, man of God, what do we do? A prophet in Zambia, he called me, he said, now I know why I raised Pampas Christians. They have been babes all along. Because we want acts, we want show. The house of God is not a place for show. If your life is not changed, it's a waste. All the meetings you attended is a waste. All the impartations are a waste. Can you make up your mind now? You know your point of disobedience. No man knows it. But the spirits know. The Bible said we have a great cloud of witnesses. That thing you did that you thought was behind closed doors. There are no doors in the spirit realm. As touching natural things. It's an open limitless expanse. If you know how many spirits were watching you'll be ashamed of yourself. I just want to be where you are Well in days in your presence I don't want to worship from afar Show me near to I just want to be where you are When it is in your presence I don't want to worship from afar Come in here to where you are Listen, tell the Lord Lord, I yield my life as a drink offering. I surrender my weaknesses to you. I will obey you, Lord. I will obey. You have troubled my heart. Today I come. Before the witness of the brethren, that I will yield myself to you. As you pray that prayer, the hand of God will begin to rest upon you. Many of you will find yourself, you begin to cry uncontrollably. Your heart is, be, is beginning to break out. 
Your heart is beginning to be poured out to God. Come on. Cry to Zion. Surrounded by your glory. Tonight, I'm trusting God that the Lord is going to recalibrate your vista so that you see from the accurate perspective of the kingdom. And a new dimension of his life will begin to find expression to you. Hallelujah. Can we just lift up our voices tonight and talk to the Lord? Can you be a little more personal about it? You, you be personal about it. You see, there's a temptation of becoming religious. There's a temptation of becoming very religious because we have come to a place where everybody is praying. Make it very personal. Oh Thank you, Lord Jesus. Can you help me choir? Oh, we the Let's align your soul tonight. I know before now you have been so charged, but just align your soul tonight. Let's build up gradually. give you praise tonight for the privilege that we have once again to gather under the pavilion of your spirit. We ask that you instruct us by your Holy Ghost, instruct us by your spirit. That word of the spirit that we require to step into deeper places with you, we ask that that word comes to us tonight. We ask that the help of the spirit that is needed to carry us through the affairs of your world carry us through the walkings of your life that help of the spirit will come to everyone tonight we ask that oh god let the spirit of wisdom and revelation be poured upon this building and let all trans be granted to explain your wisdom your counsel your ways oh lord i ask that everyone that has come with a burden in your heart that you will meet them at the point of their needs thank you father we give you praise we give you glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. You see, you may be seated. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. 
See, sometimes when you come to a meeting, your first responsibility is to create a wavelength of operations. But there are meetings that before you come into, it has already been set. The stage has already been set. And when you begin to grow in God, when maturity begins to come to your work with the Lord, you begin to learn that it's not about performance. It's about transformation. It's about becoming. So sometimes you come for a meeting and the whole place is charged. You, you, have, to, you have to step it down so that they can receive the word of the Lord. When we were much younger in the things of God, the goal was to see everywhere scatter. You see, everywhere has to be on fire. But over time, we realize that it is the word of the Lord that changes men. And some people go for meetings where the anointing of God is so strong, but they leave the meeting not transformed. The euphoria of the presence of God that they bask in lasts for a day or two, and it dies down. And then they go back to their former ways of living. That's not the objective of the kingdom. The objective of the kingdom is to raise functionaries for God. People who can bear the burden and the heartbeat of the king. It takes a lot of dealings of the Holy Spirit to bring you to a point where you become that entity that is concerned about the burden in the heart of the Father. The contract of salvation was prosecuted on two phases. The first phase takes care of your challenges. The first phase takes care of your needs. The second and most important phase of that contract takes care of the need of God. And until we come into maturity and take responsibilities in the kingdom, our needs will be met, but the needs of God will not be met. And you see, we were not created for ourselves. We were created for His glory. The Bible said, for his pleasure, all things were made. So the heavier part of salvation is for us to begin to meet the need of the Father. And that is why it becomes very important to bring the teaching of God's word. So that people can grow and come to a point of maturity. We have a a system today where people pray every day and all the prayers summarized is in asking God for something. Nobody is asking God what he will have them do. But the men that wrought wonders in the kingdom were men that asked God, what will you have me do? The reason Paul was so mighty was because his first encounter, he had understanding of the labors of the kingdom. He said, Lord, what will you have me do? There is a place in God where you can never get to. Until your prayer point changes from Lord give me to Lord what will you have me do? That's when you begin to grow in God. And the thing is you don't come there by desire. Just desire. You come there by training. You come there by process. The spirit of God walks himself through you until you come to a point where you begin to think his thoughts. You begin to feel his feelings. You can literally perceive his heartbeat then you begin to live for God, not for self. That's the goal of the faith. And tonight I'm trusting God that before I round up, a lot of persons will be plagued in their hearts. You'll be pricked in your heart so much so that you will make a decision for Jesus. Because the gospel of the kingdom brings people to that point. And that's the gospel we preach. Hallelujah. Can we open to our anchor text tonight? So that we have direction. The anointing begins to well up. It becomes a challenge to control the flow. Isaiah chapter 25 verse 6 to 12. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the less of fat things full of marrow of wines on the less well refined and he would destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all nations he will swallow up death in victory 
and the Lord God will wipe away fears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him, he will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest, and Moab shall be trodden down under him, even as straws is trodden down for the dunghill. And he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them, and he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim. And he hath brought down their pride together with the spoils of their hands, and the fortress of the high, and the fortress of the high fort of thy wars shall he bring down. Lay low and bring to the ground, even to the dust. Hallelujah. You see, I had to read the scripture. But the burden in my heart is beyond here. But sometimes you have to begin where you are told to begin. You see, when you get to the river, you start from the bank. But where you go to is subject to your discretion. So let me respect the planners of the program and begin from here. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hope you are hearing me clearly at the back. The sound is clear, right? Glory to Jesus. You see, if you summarize this scripture that we have read, it will be captioned under three syllables. If you summarize the scripture that we have read, you can categorize them under three. The first is deliverance. The second is concentration and the third is the blessing hallelujah the first is what deliverance the second is concentration the third is the blessing you know he began to speak he said upon that mountain the lord we organize a fast feast he speaks of the blessings of god that we have when we come into his presence the second syllable in that scripture tells us about how that God is going to subdue the enemy and break the covering cast. It speaks of deliverance. And the third part says, the Lord is our God. It talks about being concentrated unto the Lord. These are three broad categories upon which that scripture can be itemized. But before we begin to touch every layer of that syllable, I will have you know that you cannot begin to talk about the mountain of God unless you have understanding of the provision of the kingdom. Because when we speak of the mountain of God, we are talking about the administrative headquarters of the operations of God. God operates based on legal procedures, legal principles. In fact, the kingdom of God is, is designed such that it functions within very rigid legal contexts. Without legalities, the kingdom of God cannot find expression. So when you begin to talk about the mountain of the Lord, you are beginning to interact with the administrative headquarters, the government and the policy system of the heavens of God. And this whole scripture that we have itemized into three syllables is just talking about one context of the operations in the kingdom of God. It's the context of the covenant. If you begin to function from the heights of the heavens of God, if you begin to look at the government of the heavens, there are different layers of operation. One of those layers of operation is called the covenant. It is in the sphere of the covenant that you have the blessing, you have deliverance, and you have concentration. But there are many other layers. For instance, when you talk about the kingdom of God, you have to deal with voices. It is the voices in the kingdom of God that are responsible for administration. There are nine voices that speak in the courts of heaven. Are you with me? There are nine voices that speak in what? In the courts of heaven. Those voices are responsible for administration. Part of the administration is what you have the covenant. And I'm telling you that it is in the covenant that we have these three broad categories that we are looking at. Are we together? If you read the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22, you'll see eight out of the nine voices that speak in the courts of heaven. One of them is the voice of the judge. Another one is the voice of the church of the firstborn. Another one is the voice of the blood of sprinkling. Another one is the voice of the innumerable company of angels. Another one is the voice of the general assembly. Another one is the voice of the city of Jerusalem itself. 
and the last one is the voice of your giving that one is not captured in that scripture but it forms the nine voices that speaks in the courts of heaven and some of the things that those voices administer for is the covenant and within the context of the covenant i'm telling you that we have three operations that have been itemized in this scripture the first one is deliverance the second one is consecration and the third one is the blessing if you read the book of Obadiah chapter 1 verse 17 the bible said upon mount zion there shall be deliverance there shall be holiness and the sons of jacob shall possess their possession tonight i'm going to be talking to you about the blessing which is the possession that we have upon the mountain of god because you have come to the mountain of god if you come to the mountain of god and you spend these three days and go back and you cannot point any very graphic change in your life or any product of your being on the mountain of god then you have not made the most of the mountain it will just be added to your archive and you will go back and tell stories that so 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 time i was also on the mountain and i spent three days you know what it will do to you it will boost your pride and instead of coming closer to god you would have traveled far away from god you see that's why some people engage in prayers and when they go the only result they have from prayers is being falling they fall away from god because their prayer enterprise becomes this pride everywhere they go they put out that they pray for 10 hours so the goal of prayer is already defeated because they don't understand the context from which we have operations in the kingdom some people fast for many years and every time they come to preach they tell you how that they have fasted for 10 years so the purpose of fasting is defeated what they do is they labor in the flesh because they don't understand the essence the cardinal essence for which the operations that they are carrying out is is is, is designed tonight i want to show you the blessing so that if you don't lay hold on anything from this mountain you will lay hold on the blessing you know there are many preachers coming and everybody will try to do doctrinal exegesis to give you understanding and perspective as to the essence and the meaning of this scripture but i am come tonight not to address matters of doctrine i've come tonight to give you a gift a gift that you leave this mountain with if you want to do doctrine go to bible school and learn thoroughly but when you engage the spirit make sure that you receive something from the spirit that is the doctrine of the apostles the bible said holy men of god they speak as they were carried by the Spirit of God. The scriptures that you are reading is a function of interaction that men had in the Spirit. So every time they entered into the Spirit, they trapped something from the Spirit realm. Those things they trapped is what have become benefit for you and I. If the apostles were only entering into the Spirit realm for fun, you won't have the scriptures today. Every one of us will be confused and the body of Christ will have an amorphous shape. Everybody going in his own direction. But they understood how to maximize the spirit realm. So every time they entered into the spirit realm, they laid hold on something. One of the things they caught from the spirit realm is what we call the written scriptures. The Bible said, knowing this first, no prophecy of the scriptures for any individual interpretation. They say, holy men of God speak as they were carried. Every time they were carried in the spirit realm, they caught the utterances of God and they crystallized those utterances on papers, on doctrine, so that many years many people can look upon those writings and it will become the philosophy for their lives every time you come to the mountain of god you must lay hold on something prayer itself is not an end prayer is a means to an end the blessing is what i want to reveal to you tonight so that as you have come upon the mountain of the lord you will live here a changed man because the enterprise of spirit reality is a, it's an enterprise for kingdom advancement it's an enterprise for territorial dominion and if you don't understand how to engage those enterprises you will bask in the spirit and every time your life will have no shape your life will have no meaning and even the very essence for that enterprise will be defeated tonight i want to show you what is the blessing on mount zion there shall be deliverance there shall be holiness and the sons of jacob shall possess their possession Quickly, somebody said the blessing is the spirit. Somebody said the blessing is what? Is the spirit. The blessing is the spirit. Can you tell your neighbor the blessing is the spirit? <laughs> oh my God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Let me let me show you some scriptures before we begin to fly. 
Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. The Bible said, In whom also ye trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He said, Which is the earnest of the inheritance? He said, Upon Mount Zion there shall be what? There shall be deliverance. The sons of Jacob shall possess their possession. He said, The earnest of the inheritance is what? Is the Spirit. The earnest of the inheritance is what? The spirit. If you have not laid hold on the spirit, if you have not touched the person of the spirit, then you have not ascended the mountain. Many of you know about the spirit. Many of you have heard of the spirit. But very few know the person of the Spirit. You see, the Spirit is a promise that was given to you as a gift. He was given to you as what? As a gift. You could not have done anything to receive Him. In fact, a price was paid for you to receive Him. Now, every time you interact with God on his mountain, what happens is that heavier measures of the spirit is released upon you. That is what changes your life from sorrow to beauty. He said, until the spirit be called upon us again from on high. Now, where is the spirit called upon us? We think, Lord, Psalm 133, the Bible said, Behold, how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in harmony. He said, It is like the oil dripping from the head of Aaron to his beard down to his head. He said, It is like the dew upon Mount Hermon. There the Lord commanded his blessings. If you are a participator of the activity on the mountain, even if you do not know how, what happens is that there is a corporate ranking that we achieve in worship that causes the Spirit of God to descend upon us. The reason for teaching on the mountain is so that you can your see. Because the spirit of necessity must rest. Are we together? Okay, let me show you another scripture. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. See what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. It's verse 13, right? So you can read it there and see for yourself. It said, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. What do you say? The blessings. That the blessings of Abraham come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we may receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see that the totality of our inheritance is God. is called the Spirit. A lot are not taught. So when they come to God, they pursue things. Our only objective in the kingdom is the apprehension of the Spirit. When you pray, your goal is not time. A lot of spiritual brethren have missed it. You see them in the place of prayer with so much vigor. But their goal is to beat 5 hours. Their goal is to beat 10 hours. But the Holy Ghost is far from them. So they pray for 10 hours but they don't hear a whisper from the Holy Spirit. There are brethren that fast for 21 days. Their goal is time. At the end of that activity, they don't hear anything from the Holy Ghost. The goal is the person, the spirit. Everything you will ever have in God is already encapsulated in the Holy Spirit. Your apprehension of the spirit of God is your apprehension of your health. Apprehension of your riches. 
is your apprehension of vitality. You must therefore make every demand upon yourself to apprehend the person of the Holy Spirit. There are people who are given to all kinds of activity now. Activity does not change anybody. Activity does not transform anybody. It is the supply of the Spirit that makes the difference. I'm a traveling minister. I move around the country virtually every week. I can set this place on fire in 15 minutes. But I've come to discover that most times people don't even hear what we say. So in recent time, I take time to emphasize some of these basics. When you go to the place of prayer, what do you focus on? Consciously focus on the Holy Spirit. Now, the Spirit of God is being released already upon this mountain. And you have been there here for more than 24 hours. What has God told you as an individual? What has God whispered to your heart since you came? Activities are going on. Power of God is moving. A lot of things are happening. What have you heard from God? What have you apprehended already? Who told you you will get it tomorrow? Come and be carried in the bandwagon and think you are doing something. The moment you are separated, you discover you are empty. The possession that is given upon the mount is the spirit. And everyone that comes to the mountain of the Lord must lay hold on the spirit. Are we together? Everyone that comes to the mount of the Lord must do what? Must lay hold on the spirit. It took God a lot for the spirit to be supplied. That's what a lot of us don't know. You see, when Jesus was in the world, carrying out his earthly ministry, he was the only person in possession of the Holy Ghost. Are we together? But the goal of Jesus was to ensure that every one of us have the Holy Spirit. Now, have you asked yourself, why does God want you to have the Holy Spirit? In fact, the Bible said, everything that Jesus did, he did by the Father who was in him. Speaking about the Holy Spirit. Are we together? Now, when Jesus finished his earthly ministry, the promise of the Father was released to the world. In Psalm 110, verse 1 to 3, the Bible speaks of what happened when Jesus ascended and sat at the right hand of God. He said, the rod of thy strength shall ascend out of Zion. That was when the Holy Ghost was giving marching orders from heaven. And he left heaven and came to earth. The apostles in the place of prayers, which is also a prophetic mountain, trapped the Holy Spirit. And immediately they began to advance the kingdom. When Peter was asked why and what was going on, he told them in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 verse 30 to 36. He said, that same Jesus whom you crucified is today being exalted as Lord and Christ. So, the release of the Spirit of God is an evidence that Jesus is the Lord over your life. But has a purpose. What is the purpose for the release of the Spirit? You see, God does not do things because he wants to do things. God does things because there are definite purpose for what he does. And if you have not understood the purpose for which God is doing what he's doing, you can never make the most of it. That is why it's as if most of us don't have our possessions. Are we together? Because even when we have it, we don't know the purpose. And my Moreau said, when the purpose of the thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. And you cannot abuse the things of God. So if you don't know the purpose for its giving, then you can never operate in its reality. If you don't know the purpose for which it is given, you can never operate in its reality. Why then was the Holy Spirit given? Why was the Holy Ghost given? Why would Jesus have to go through the perils of dying, the pains and the agony, for the Holy Spirit to be supplied? It has a purpose. And that's the purpose for which we are all gathered. 
You see, before the fall of man, hallelujah, before the fall of man, you know, tonight, I'm just trying to build the foundation. You can't just come and just start jumping. I just try to build the foundation, get you to a point where I want before. Before the fall of man, man knew God as the Elohim. The word Elohim means the Almighty. It speaks of the all-powerful nature of God. Elohim, Almighty. Now, this dimension of God that was revealed was the might of God in His creative ability. Because He had all powers. He had the authority to create all things. He had the power to create everything. So He was called the Almighty. Now, the dimension of the Almighty that man knew was the fatherhood dimension. So, in the context of the fatherhood dimension, everything that man required, God provided for him. Even before he could ask for it. Now, because man knew God in this context, man became completely oblivious of the legal system of heaven. So, he felt everything was at his beck and call. He didn't know that the same God that provided everything was also the righteous God that we judge all kinds of iniquity. So man knew him as Elohim until the day he fell. Suddenly, the Elohim he knew became Jehovah. And the Jehovah that showed up came to judge him. Suddenly, the God provided things began to chase him away from what he was provided to have. The reason is because what was provided was not just for luxury. What was provided had a definite purpose. I'm going somewhere. What was provided had what? A definite purpose. Man felt everything was provided for luxury. And the moment he defied the protocol for the provision that was made for him, he was sentenced out of that. Because he was not provided for luxury. He was provided for purpose. And he didn't know it. Suddenly, the God that always came to have fellowship with him now came to judge him. And that man did not learn the lesson of transferring that knowledge to his children. The same thing began to happen from his own descendants. You know, God was very playful. God was very jovial with Adam. So much so that they could interact and talk to God on a very careless note. You know how it is when you go to pray and then you just lie down and cross your leg on the bed and say, Lord, you know, I'm tired. Uh, thank you. I love you. You know those kind of things. They, they were used to God like that. You know, they could just come to God and say, God, how are you doing? Yeah, Lord, thank you for today. And then they sleep off. They are going out. They, they can't just wait to pray for five minutes. As they are going out, they, Lord, take over. Thank you. Take over. And they are gone. You know, they became very jovial and playful with God like that. Until one day, they came to provide an offering to the Lord. And suddenly, the offering of Abel was accepted. And the offering of Cain was rejected. And God told Cain, why are you rough? Why is your countenance down? If you did right, you will be applauded. Instead of Cain learning the lesson, he thought it was the same Jovia God that he knew. And he went and slew his brother. And God showed up and began to speak from the mountain of God. And he said, Cain, Cain, where is thy brother? And Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? You see, the answer that Cain gave showed you the kind of relationship that Cain had with God. You see, when a man already knows the spirit, he can discern the mood of the spirit. For a man who knows God, for a man who knows the Holy Spirit, he knows when the Holy Ghost shows up as a king. He knows when the Holy Ghost shows up as a judge. He knows when the Holy Ghost shows up as a friend. He knows when the Holy Ghost shows up as a father. So his response to the Holy Ghost is based on his understanding of who he is part time. These guys did not know God because they had not apprehended who God was. They were only interacting with God. Friendly note. And they thought all God was but what they knew. Until a point came where they broke the legal system of heaven. And God said, where is thy brother? Cain said, I am not my brother's keeper. Suddenly, God began to open a new syllabus to him. He said, the voice of thy brother is crying to me from the ground. The story had changed. The voice of thy brother is crying to me from the ground. He said, the very ground that opened its mouth to suck thy brother's blood has cost thee. He said, from today, shall not give you thy strength anymore. And he said, you shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the face of the earth. When you do not know the purpose of the blessing, the blessing can fight you. Do you see why a lot of Christians, their lives look wayward and careless? 
They are praying, they are doing all kinds of things, but it seems as if the people in the world are prospering more because you don't understand how the protocol of the possession that you have received is. The possession that you have received is not material. The possession you have received is a person. His name, the Holy Ghost. And he has feelings, he has emotions, he has will, he has purpose. He has the reason for his interaction with you. That blessing is meant for your glory. But if you do not know how to interact with that blessing sufficiently, a point will come in your life where that blessing will become the reason why you are caused. Where is thy brother? Am I my brother's keeper? So why did you receive the blessing? You receive the blessing for two reasons. The first reason is to redeem you from the fallen state. Is to redeem you from what? Fallen state. I know you've been here for long. Don't worry. You made a statement. You made a statement. You say even when they are sleeping, so it can take place. Hallelujah. The purpose is first of all to what? To redeem you. Now, when man fell, something happened. Something happened when man fell. Are we together? The man that God created, God created this man with three cardinal essence. The first was to be in the image of God. The second was to be in the likeness of God. And the third was to have dominion. Are we together? Now, the effect of the fall of man was three. Apart from his environment. Alright? Personally, the effect of man were three. He was denatured. Are we together? The man was what? Was denatured. So instead of being the image of God, he took the image of the devil. So Jesus would tell the Pharisees that you are of your father, the devil. So the nature that was supposed to be the nature of God became the nature of the devil, the serpentine nature. Secondly, the likeness of man, which was supposed to be the character and the expression, the ability of God was also the nature. And man began to operate like the world system. And thirdly, the dominion that this man was supposed to have was also subjugated. So instead of having dominion over the earth, the man became dominated. So three things happened. The image of God was replaced with the loss of the eyes. The likeness of God was replaced with the loss of the flesh. And the dominion that he had was replaced with the pride of life. Listen now. According to the law of the spirit, what you see, you become. Pay attention. What you see, you do what? You become. The Bible said in 3 verse 1, it said, Behold, what power of love the Father have bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be like, but when we shall see him, we shall be like him. The moment the man fell, what happened is that his vistas were denatured. He could no longer see God. So what he sees now was the serpent. And the more he saw the serpent, the more he became like the serpent. That was the denaturing that the man suffered on account of the fall. Secondly, the man began to eat and eat only the things that were of the world. So he took the nature of the world. What you eat is what you be like. The man only ate what came out of the world. So his whole constitution was dominated by the world. And he became a complete entity of the world. And lastly, the man became a proud man. Instead of having dominion, he tries to fake it because he doesn't have the power for it anymore. The power to dominate was no longer there. So he needs to fake it. And every time he fakes it and assumes to be it or make be like, what he's doing is that he is manifesting the name of pride because dominion is lost. The Holy Spirit, which is the possession we have received, came first of all to restore the denatured man. That is why every time you come to the mountain of the Lord and you apprehend the Holy Spirit, the first thing you notice is that there is inward transformation. There is what? Inward transformation. The denatured man is what? Restored. Are we together? Secondly, what the possession does is that it gives you authority for dominion. What do you dominate? In dominion, we advance the kingdom. We do what? We advance the kingdom. Pay attention. The nature is corrected and the kingdom is what? Is advanced. Those are the two cardinal reasons for the possession of the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, 
and you are not enjoying transformation, then you need to come to the mountain and receive higher methods. Because the first goal is what? Transformation. If you study the life of Jesus, everything Jesus did was by the Spirit. The Bible said in Luke chapter 2 verse 40 that he grew in the Spirit. In Matthew he was led. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 he said he was led of the Spirit. Everything he did was by the Spirit. In the book of Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 2 he, through the Spirit, gave commandments to the apostles. Because Jesus knew that because man is falling, nothing done by the nature of man can succeed anymore. Unless it is filtered through the vista of the Holy Spirit. So he had the Spirit without measure. Every one of us once and again must come to the mountain of God to receive plenishing of the Holy Spirit. When the apostles were being threatened, they went back to their own company. The Bible said they lifted their voices and they prayed. And the Spirit of God fell upon them. And they received boldness. And that speaks of the second thing that the Spirit does. To advance the kingdom. See, in the last days, in the last days which we are in now, the only responsibility we have is to advance the kingdom. Is to advance the kingdom. Is to advance the kingdom. I'm coming from a place where just step out of your house and then you place have been raided. People have been killed. There is a battle going on in the world currently. It's a battle of kingdom domination. Every one of us have been called to advance the kingdom. Every one of us have been called to do what? To advance the kingdom. What is the kingdom? What is the kingdom? I'm trying to tie my knots now. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is the governing influence of the Holy Spirit over the school of a man. The kingdom is what? The governing influence of the Holy Spirit over the soul of a man. The kingdom is what? The governing influence of the Holy Spirit over the soul of a man. You must be brought under the authority of that government. And every time a man is apprehended by that government, that man becomes an extension of that government. So you go about releasing the spirit to others so that they too will come under that government. Every one of us must come under what? The governing influence of the Holy Spirit. And as you have come under the governing influence of the Holy Spirit, what happens is that you begin to advance the same. The reason you have come to the mount of the Lord tonight is so that you can receive the supply of the Spirit. First of all, to govern your soul and to bring you under obedience to the Holy Spirit. And then secondly, to advance the same to your word. You manifest it by your words, by your character, by everything that proceeds out of you. We are in a system today where people preach gospels that allow them to do what they want because there is forgiveness. I told you when I started, if that is all you know, then your needs have been met or the needs of God have not been met. Because the need of God is to bring all creation under obedience to his government. The 20 and 4 elders, the Bible said, they fell on their faces. And as they worshipped, they cried, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord. And one of the things they said is that all things were made for thy pleasure. All things were made for thy pleasure. Until your life comes under the government of the Holy Spirit, you cannot be pleasurable to the Lord. And the moment your life comes under the government of the Holy Spirit, what happens is that it becomes contagious to other people. You bring others also under that government. So you are no longer just pleasurable to the Lord, but everything around you becomes pleasurable to the Lord. That's where the power is. Hallelujah. You can see people praying in tongues every day, but there is no power. There is no power because what tongues does for you is to force you to ascend in faith. Is to open your sensitivity to God so that you can hear Him better. 
In fact, when you pray in tongues, what happens is that that government becomes stronger. Some of the things you were doing before that the Holy Ghost didn't say anything, suddenly you start hearing him rebuke you. And it could be as simple as talking. Talking. You talk so much and he's grieved. If you want to function in the kingdom, then you have to stop. It could be as eating excessively. It could be as simple as neglecting a lot of things. And the Holy Ghost wants to be part of every aspect. Have you seen somebody who is under the influence of a marine? Everything they do, the spirit wants to be manifested. In their talking, they try to entice people. In their dressing, in their walking, everywhere they are, they want to manifest. Spirit wants to be manifested through you. And the only way they can manifest through you is if you are obedient to them. The difference between the Holy Spirit and the demon is that he will not force you. A demon breaks the law. The Holy Ghost is the one that sets the laws of the Spirit. He will not break the laws of the Spirit. So what he does is that he suggests it to you. The more you yield to him, the more he manifests himself through you. That is why your life becomes a living sacrifice. Because you will willingly submit yourself. You will be dying, but your eyes will be open. But if you continue like that, over time you will discover that the denatured man is beginning to be reconfigured. Suddenly you discover the lust of the eyes begin to diminish. The lust of the flesh begins to diminish. The pride of life begins to diminish. What the Holy Ghost is trying to achieve through obedience is to bring you to a point where people looking at you will be looking at him. People talking to you will be talking to him. Everywhere you go, he's the one that they see. Brehard Bonke entered South Africa to buy something and the seller just looked at him and began to cry. And he asked the Lord, what happened? And the Lord said, he saw me through your eyes. You don't get to that level by praying. You don't get to that level by fasting. You get to that level through obedience. What prayer and fasting does for you is it energizes your spirit to obey. Because you cannot obey with your will. Why? Your will is already subjugated. Your will has been subjugated. Only pride is now finding expression through your will. You cannot achieve it by emotion because your emotion has been corrupted. The only way you can achieve it is by aligning to the government of the Holy Spirit. The point comes where you come to a city and everything you do, God is manifested. A story was told about Lester Sumro. He entered the city and the moment he entered that city, darkness of 25 years was rolled away. And the young preacher got up and said, Lord, I've been praying for this darkness for many years. Said because my son Lester Sumro came into the city, the darkness prayed darkness. What happened is that through obedience he had gained the status with God that everywhere he appeared, it is the government that shows up. The calling that we have is a calling onto a supernatural living. But the only way for you to manifest. That's why the gospel is not in words. I can choose to come here and not preach to you. If I lift the song and begin to sing, the kingdom of God will begin to find expression. It's not in words. Paul said the kingdom of God is in the demonstration of power. That power is achieved through obedience. Every time you obey, you die. Every time you obey, you die. And every time you die, God manifests. Every time you die, God rises on your inside. God can only express himself through a dead man. Because everywhere that self, God is killed. The only way God can find expression is for self to give way. And self can only give way on the altar of obedience. Do you know why the great men always have to pass through hurdles? It's not because God is interested in seeing people suffer. But if they do not go through those paths, God cannot be revealed through them. In the case of Abraham, God had to carry him through a journey of many years of obedience. He said, leave thy kingdom, leave thy kindred, leave thy father's house. And come to the land that I will show you. And I will bless you. Abraham carried Lot. And as Abraham carried Lot, God did not speak to him. Until Lot separated from Abraham. And the Bible said, the moment Lot separated from Abraham. In Genesis chapter 13 verse 14. God said, lift up thy eyes and see. From the north, the south, the east, the west. He said, as much as you can see, I have given to you. After God gave Abraham the son. It was as if he had achieved obedience. God said, keep that child. The moment Abraham obeyed, God didn't let him. 
what God was trying to achieve was to kill self, was to kill ambition, was to kill appetite, was to kill his own objective, so that the objective of God can find expression. And God said, because I have done this, I now know that you fear me. And he said, in blessings, I will bless you. See, in the kingdom, we don't pray for things. When you have received the Holy Spirit, you have received all things. The Holy Ghost is your health. The Holy Ghost is your riches. The Holy Ghost is your power. What you need to do is to obey Him. The more you obey, the more He manifests. And every area of your life that the Holy Ghost begins to manifest, God begins to manifest. Why do you waste your time praying for what to eat and drink? The Bible said that is what the pagans do. Why would a Christian be praying for what to eat and drink? Jesus said that's what the heathens do. We don't pray for those things. Our goal is to align with Him every day. Every day I wake up in the morning, I pray for grace to obey. The more you obey, the more God is seen. It is a simple thing for you to take over your world. Only 12 men shook the foundation of their world because they were obedient to the Holy Spirit. That is what is lacking in the body of Christ today. They come to tell you that anything you do can be forgiven. Yes, God will forgive you, but you will never amount to anything in God. And your voice can never speak for Him. Neither can He manifest through your generation. A day is coming where God will place a demand on your life. And until you come to that point where God can place a demand on your life, you have not begun to walk with Him. The journey of the faith is not a journey unto receiving. It's a journey to walk with the Lord. And only men of obedience will walk with the Lord. There was a time in my life when my walk with God became intense. And God began to place demand upon my life. I was going to the house and one day a voice walked out of the wall. And I saw it coming towards me. You know, there are so many things in the spirit realm that you never know until you, are, you make up your mind to go deeper with God. You will not know what it means for a voice to walk until you are willing to obey. I was going to the house and a voice walked out of the wall. And I heard what the voice was saying. And the voice was speaking and entering into me. He said, Michael, leave Chidera. You will see my power in your life. Chidera was my idol. I loved her with all of my heart. I didn't have anything carnal with her. But God wanted me to die. And that day he said, leave Chidera. You will see my power in your life. That day I had the privilege of seeing the voice of God walking into me. And the strength entered. It took me four months to obey. But the day I obeyed, my soul entered another level of alignment. I walked into the prayer tent. And I came. the moment I entered the prayer tent, the, the, the neighbors were shouting. A spirit hit the lady on the chest and she fell and died. The lady had died for three hours. And I called my friend and said, let's go there. We went there and we prayed and the lady came back to life. That was the first time I prayed for the dead and the dead came back to life. Not because I have faith for praying for the dead. What obedience does to you is that it recalibrates your lenses. You see, do you know a converging lens? Have you seen a converging lens? If you want a converging lens to burn, what you need to do is be arranging it, shift it close to the light. A point comes where you hit the focal lens. When you hit the focal lens, the light converges. Anything that light touch begins to burn. If you want to walk beyond faith, you need to subscribe to obedience. I didn't have the faith to raise the dead. I only had obedience. And he said, when your obedience is fulfilled, you will attend other disobedience. The reason your walk with God looks epileptic is because you have not introduced obedience into the equation. When obedience is added into the equation, what happens is that life begins to find expression through you. Every gate and every chamber of your soul that is locked will begin to open up. It will begin to open up. Every one of us have the fullness of God in our spirit. Don't be deceived. The guy doing mighty things does not have more of God. The only difference is that his soul, his soul can conduct more God than your soul can conduct. If you want your soul to begin to conduct the Lord, subscribe to the portals of obedience. The voice of the Holy Ghost is clear to every one of us. It's clear to every one of us. The difference is obedience. The more you hear and obey, the more instructions you receive. It doesn't begin by calling names. The goal is not calling names. When God entrusts a man with the ability to call names and judge iniquity, it's because pride has been dealt with sufficiently. Because when that man calls that name, it's not for the show. He's calling that name so that faith can arise in the heart of the person. But a man who has not subscribed to obedience, when he calls name, he wants you to hear it on Facebook. He wants you to hear it on Twitter. That him too calls name. The goal is not calling of name. The goal is deliverance. Deliverance is about to be engendered. And only a man of sufficient stature will be given the privilege of orchestrating that deliverance. And that happens on the altar of obedience. Tonight, I want to let you know that the only way to apprehend the spirit is to accept the path of obedience. It's a narrow path. Not many choose it. Only few choose that path because it's not a convenient path. 
that's the part you choose when the Holy Ghost has the liberty to tap you by 1 a.m. and say, get up and pray. You, he knows you slept by 12. But now he said, get up. He said, get up and pray. You see, at first you'll be struggling with sleep. Because you think God wants to deny you of sleep. A point comes when you do it for long. As you stand up by one to pray, then the Lord opens your eyes. And then he shows you that somebody is about to be killed in Lewi. But because you have reason, that person will leave. You don't know how people become great in the kingdom. That's why you think it's all about praying. You come for prayer meeting and then you are shouting for everybody to see you. My brother, you will pray like that for long and you will not amount to anything. After you are done with the prayer meeting, then the Holy Ghost comes. The Holy Ghost shows up. You buy the dress. You trim it. You want to go out. You open the cleavages. And then he said, Bro, don't wear this dress again. Ah, the people are waiting to see you. You want to slay everybody because you are the slave queen. He said, don't wear that dress. That's where the power is. The power is not just in talking in tongues. That time when you go out and then the beggar passes and he said, give him that. That's the only thing you have to eat. He said, give it to him. Ah, those are the gate to power. Power is by obedience. The Bible said after Jesus was baptized of the Holy Ghost, he was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he was tempted, the Bible said he returned in the power of the Spirit. And he said that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet in the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. He said, The people that sat in darkness, behold, a great light is come forth. Jesus would not have been the light, but until he chose to obey. If Jesus had not obeyed, he would have remained a carpenter. He was 80 years a carpenter. But when he obeyed for 40 days, a carpenter changed into a light. He was not just a light for his family. He was a light unto Judea and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He took only 40 days of obedience. 40 years of prayer could not change anything. 30 years of prayers could not change anything. But 40 days of obedience transformed the carpenter to become a light. I don't know what you are in God. But let me tell you something. If you do not arise today, on the other side of the divide you will be judged every one of us will be judged God has not called you to be created everything that you are supposed to be has already been written the Holy Ghost came as a compass to guide you into your inheritance he came as a compass to guide you into your destiny those things have been written God knows that today you will be on this mountain and you are on this mountain today because tomorrow there is a city that you are supposed to deliver. But if your pride does not die, if your appetite does not die, maybe that city there is no light. You are the one who bring electricity there, but you are waiting for the government to take light. You have not seen yourself as a savior. The Bible says, Savior shall arise from Mount Zion to judge the mounts of Esau. Until you see beyond your present circumstance, you cannot see God in your life. It's called the pathway of obedience. The pathway of obedience. Moses was a prince in Egypt. He was a prince. He had everything he needed. But a point came when kingdom began to rage in his heart. Kingdom began to rage. He thought he hated the Egyptians. He did not know that it was into the nation calling him. But the nations were calling. It was calling. You see that point comes when suddenly you feel like praying. Every evening, before you used to go to watch this football match. But now every evening there's a hunger to pray. There's a hunger to pray. You don't know why. But the nations are beginning to call you. They are beginning to call you. See, when you begin to grow in God, you understand how spirits work. You see, there are times when, because your window is about to open, God deploys angels in your room. What those angels do is that they begin to charge the walls of the room. And then as you enter the room, you begin to hear music. You think you know the song. It's not a song you know. Angels are whispering it. You are picking it in your soul. What they are doing is that they are charging the room. They are charging the walls of the room. If you cooperate with them not too long, one day you will see Jesus walking through the wall. The men that see things are men of understanding. Moses thought he hated the Egyptian. He didn't know that the nations were calling. He killed an Egyptian. He came again. He wanted to kill another. They said, ah, you that killed somebody, you want to correct us? And he ran away. 
he was running into the wilderness to be free. Because everything God designs for you, sometimes they look like circumstances. You need to be a man of understanding to know that those things that are happening in your life are not circumstances. They are their pathways of ordination. Pay now. Saul went to look for his father's missing asses. God had told Samuel that tomorrow the man that comes anointed as king. In the head of Saul, he was looking for asses. He didn't know that his footsteps were being guided because the path of the just, the steps of the righteous is order. Is order. You didn't come to this mountain because your friend told you to come. You came because of the nation is calling. The nation is calling. For Moses, it took him 40 years to lead sheep. God was not raising him to be a shepherd of our sheep. He was supposed to carry 3 million people out of captivity. You see, these people don't have a country. They have been in slavery all their lives. They were there for 430 years. It was Moses that would teach them how to pray. It was Moses that would teach them how to worship. It was Moses that would teach them how to talk, how to live like sons of God. He said, teach them statutes, ordinances, precepts, counsels, and ordination. Teach them those things. For Moses to have the stature to do it, he had to teach sheep in the wilderness for 40 years. Because the people he was going to carry would behave like animals. If Moses does not understand how animals behave, he wouldn't have survived with the children of Israel. The reason you are going through what you are going through today is because there is something waiting for you tomorrow. It is only through obedience that you will bend your head to learn the lessons now. Because in the day of your showing forth, it will be woe unto you if you fail. The Bible said John was separated into the wilderness until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. And how bright he appeared. Jesus said he was a burning and a shining light. You're only looking at your circumstances. God will not take it away. What you need to do now is to begin to look at the Holy Spirit. Every time he whispers, obey. Obey. This one is not doctrine. I say I didn't come here to teach you doctrine. Every time the Holy Ghost whispers, obey. That's the path to greatness. And you have eluded it for long. A time will come when you come for prayer meeting and pray for four hours. You didn't touch the spirit realm, my sister. You only joined the convoy. When you get home, maybe that five minutes, a window opens. And God said, pray now. Oh, Jesus. I wish you could see in the spirit. Sometimes the things that come to you and you think is your thought. It was an angel whispering into your ears. Oh, my God. I wish you understand how the spirit realm operates. The angel comes and says, pray now. Oh, pray now. A window is open in heaven. Those things you were asking for, that is the time of the answer. You know, Jesus was walking into Jerusalem. And he said, oh, he lamented over Jerusalem. He said, there will be no stone left here unturned. There will be gnashing of teeth. There will be besieged on every time. He said, because thou knoweth not the times of thy visitation. Most of you have eluded your windows for long. For long. That time you ran from church and you wanted to go on Facebook. That was the time the Holy Ghost was speaking. When you were in church, you were the one talking. Now he wants to speak for you on Facebook. Be wise. It takes a man of understanding to understand the dynamics of the spirit. And until you get to that point, your life will never change. Some of you, there is a circle around your life. Every December, that is when you fall into immorality. You are not wise. The demons know that that is the time when your windows open. So before the windows open, first of all, two months ahead of time, they, they make you watch nude pictures. You watch nude pictures to fertilize your appetite. And then when the window is about to open, that's when that your old friend comes back and says, How have you been? You have thrown me away. It's a lie. If you are wise, you will tell him, we were never wise. Somebody who didn't talk to you from January comes in December and says, you have thrown me away. And then the next thing you are sitting in Mr. Biggs. And then the next thing you are visiting in his house. You are not wise. You will remain in that circle for many years. Because you have received a doctrine that tells you that repentance is for everybody. That forgiveness is a free luxury. There is forgiveness. But there is also a call for service. It is the apostolic order of Christianity. It is a call unto obedience to the government of God. It's a call unto self-denial. A call unto sacrificial living. It's a help, therefore, having received a kingdom that cannot be moved. Nothing moves that kingdom. Having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us receive grace whereby we serve God acceptably in reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Tonight, you want to receive of the earnest of the Spirit. I'll pray with you. I just wanted to lay foundations tonight. I know you have been listening to the word of the Lord. You've been here from morning. Your cells are weak. 
Or you see, there's an energy level in the spirit realm. Men of understanding know it. See, the reason we preach all through the night and we can still pray through the night is because we tap into an energy, not because we are strong men. Jesus will carry out the crusade through the whole day and then he will climb the mountain and pray till morning and then stand up and minister for the next day throughout. There is an energy in the spirit. I was teaching in the Bible school and I had, I had taught for 12 hours. And then I told them it's time for impartation. And people could not even stand up, they were tired. I told them not to worry. There are, there are, late, there are energy levels in the spirit. If you have done chemistry, you know that there are electrons operate at different orbitals. There are energy levels in the spirit. One of the mysteries of ascending those heights in the spirit is called sound. You see, well, well, if you get the right sound, you can climb. And when you climb, suddenly, you that was weak, it enters you. But as that energy enters you tonight, I don't want you just to enjoy the atmosphere and fall down. We've seen people fall, and they go back and commit sex. We've seen them. As, you, as the energy comes tonight, I want you to make a conscious commitment to the Holy Spirit. Get everybody, tell the Holy Spirit, walk with me now. Give me another chance. I'm ready to walk with you. The Bible said, The Lord knoweth them that are His. They that name the name of the Lord should depart from iniquity. I've learned enough not to be deceived by people. I've seen pastors fall. And they did not come to be helped. Because they began to enjoy iniquity. I've learned enough not to be deceived. You can be here and today. But nothing will change in your life. Change comes by the one of And as you make that decision, not that they are going to the Holy Spirit begins to help you. Begins to help you. Begins to help you. Begins to help you. And we be on our feet and pray for people. The Holy Ghost begins to help you. The Holy Ghost begins to help you. The Holy Ghost begins to help you. Some of you, the enemies that have fought you are enemies within. They are in your soul. They are strongholds of darkness. They are within. They are within. It's time to arise and contend for your destiny. Sopra hapata kiboro bobundus. Ika pata kabora baba sanda lika pata. Can you go ahead and pray in the spirit? It says, building up yourself upon your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Some of you are great men. Some are great women. The devil have deceived you thus far. You have sold your future on the altar of pleasure. But tonight, that enemy will be, will be gauged. He said, when the thief be caught, he will pay sevenfold. The years that the caterworm, the caterpillar worm, the palmer worms have eaten, is about to be restored. Can you go ahead and talk to the Lord? Talk to the Lord tonight. Sapa take borahata. Mama masa kabala baborah. Ile le kaboboro boso matahaya. Rahaba pata kiboro bundo salata. Era kaboboro boso matahaya. Rahaba pata kiboro bundo salata. Era kaboboro boso matahaya. Rahaba pata kiboro this morning, cry to the Lord, cry to the Lord. The day of salvation is now. Now is the day of salvation. Is there weeping to endure for the night? For joy comes in the morning. This morning is the presence of God. Reverend, weeping to endure for the night. I thought the excitement would be more than that. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. This morning, you know, we as young people, we are full of energy. Oftentimes, the challenge we have is with time. <laughs> But I trust that the Lord will do a quick walk this morning. Apostle will always tell us, it doesn't take God eternity to do that, which is eternal. 
So just lift your hands toward heaven and worship the Lord one more time. As we appear before the throne of him that is God eternal. Whisper something to the Lord from the depths of your heart. It's possible to be lost in the service. It's possible not to participate in the service. We are taking the announcements. The choir are doing the administrations and you are just there watching. Whereas every time we come to a corporate service like this, it's needful for us to make an appearance before the Lord. The Bible said they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion that appeared before the Lord. Sometimes the reason we become weak, even though we are participating corporately in an assembly like this is because we fail to make appearance in Zion. Because every time we make an appearance, the Bible said of necessity, we go from strength to strength. So strength is a function of appearing before the God of Zion. Can you whisper to him this morning from the depths of your heart? Say something to the Lord. Maybe you've not told him this week how much you love him. Like the sister said earlier. Can you go ahead and just say something to Jesus? And I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I just want to be where you are. In your dwelling place forever. Take me to the place where you are. I just want to be with you. And so precious Father, this morning, we thank you for the privilege that we have to congregate under the auspices of your spirit. We ask that you will instruct us. We ask that you will impart us. We ask that you would empower us so that as we go into our words, we will become an extension of your reality in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God bless you. We are considering the subject living epistles and we are looking at the inability of being experientially living epistles as a challenge of enlargement. The Lord began to help us as we started this conference by exposing us to depths in scriptures as touching what it means to be a living epistle. And this morning, I would like to look at three very significant and very strategic implications of um, what it means or what living epistles are in the kingdom of God. Most times we approach truth from the standpoint of theological dexterity. Most times we approach truth from the standpoint of biblical accuracy. But truth will not have implication in our lives except we begin to consider it from the standpoint of life. It is possible to know about God and speak authoritatively and verbosely about him but it will not have existential implication in your life. It's possible to talk about the healing power of God, yet you are dying of sickness. It's possible to talk about the love of God, yet your heart is clotted with bitterness. One of the effects that reveals the fact that we have not truly understood 
a spiritual reality is when it's only a mental assertion, not an existential expression. So we cannot truly understand what it means to be a living epistle until the implications of a living epistle becomes our daily expressions. This is where truth becomes a, pro a proponent of life and reality. Many Christians in the world, but oftentimes when we look at the territories, it looks as if there are more unbelievers than there are Christians. It looks as if there are more demons than there are angels. And it looks as if the devil himself is more powerful than God. There is a crisis that must be dealt with. And one of the strategic intelligences that God has put in place in order to remediate the effect of the fall and to bring his kingdom to bear is the strategy of living witnesses walking on the streets and walking in the systems of this world. The world have no reason to be in darkness if there are true witnesses and living episodes walking in every sphere of human endeavor. So if our territory is in darkness, it's not because the devil is strong. It's because we have refused to take responsibility for who we truly are in God. This is where realities become much more than theological assertions and biblical, exegetical accuracy and intelligence. Three implications this morning and in the next 40 minutes will be done. We began by saying a living epistle is a proof and an exhibit of the reality of God. A living epistle is a communication, a vessel of communication that brings to bear the mind of God, the will of God, the purpose of God, so that the government of God is established in his sphere of influence. And on the strength of this, we declared very authoritatively that is beyond talking about God. It is actually living as God. And looking at the context where we find ourselves and the context in which we were born, we saw that it would be literally impossible to live like God in a dark and a fallen creation. First, because we were born in sin. Secondly, because the world itself is falling. So what is that strategic intelligence that God has put in place to make a man who is born in sin into a fallen world to become an expression of God? This becomes the weight of the subject. Not just to declare that we are living epistles, not just to declare that we are supposed to be living epistles. Every one of us is aware of that. How do we become living epistles? Becomes the big challenge that confronts every one of us. When sin comes into your borders, what do you do about it to manifest the righteousness of God? Becomes the big challenge. The challenge is not to know that you are supposed to be the righteousness of God. How do you become manifestly the righteousness of God? Becomes the challenge. When the devil comes into the family, how do you become the expression of the power of God? Becomes the challenge. The question is not knowing what ought to be. The question is how to get what ought to be to become what is. And this is where many are challenged. This is where the devil oftentimes tries to make a mockery of our belief system. But there is a way. And we saw that the simplest and most accessible way of achieving this reality is by our interaction with the word of God. The Bible said in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. It said all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life 
was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So if there is darkness, it means the believer have not become light by the word. And if the believer have not become life, light, it simply means he has not made contact with life. Because until the life that flows from the world becomes the experience of the believer, he cannot be a light in darkness. And we said many times, interacting with the word of God becomes the challenge of the believer. We receive it graciously and sometimes even religiously, but we don't engage it. The Bible said in John chapter 1 verse 10 to 11 and 12. He said he came into the world. The world knew him not. Of course the world cannot know him. Because the world is falling. The world is alien to his reality. When Adam fell. Creation and man rebelled. He said but as many as received him. To them he gave the right to become the sons of God. And that is where most of us stop. We stop when we become the sons of God. So there is no experience. Legally, we are the sons of God. But experientially, we are expressions of different spirits apart from God. So you look at the sister, dressed half naked. And you say, what is your name? And she say, my name is Mary. You look at the brother. You say, what is your name? He was caught scamming on the internet. And he said, my name is Christian. Legally, he has been born again, accepted Jesus. But experientially, his life is an expression of Babylon. His life is an expression of Jezebel. His life is an expression of Mammon, the God of commerce. What is the problem? God is supposed to be the most powerful. The Bible said all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And you have received the all-powerful God. How come you are still a puppet in the hands of the devil? The inability to engage the world. In verse 16, he said, we beheld him. The people that journey from legal reality to experiential reality. He said, we beheld him. And when we beheld him, we no longer saw the logos. He said, we saw him as the glory of the father. Full of grace and truth. Others only received him and stopped. But some people went further. He said, we beheld. The moment we beheld we began to see something much more than the Logos. Somebody has received him because they told him, for God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son. But somebody else, after hearing that and accepting that truth, sat on the truth and began to look upon it. How is this possible? And as he beheld, the Bible said the glory was made manifest. And Paul came in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He said, we all with unveiled faces. What unveiled our face is the acceptance of Jesus Christ. He said, for the Lord that was given on the mountain, even though the face of Moses shone, till this day, the veil was upon them. But he said, as we turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. So when we received him, the veil is removed. But the irresponsibility of beholding, to see the glory, becomes the crisis of our life. He said, as we beheld him, we are changed from glory to glory, by the Spirit, even to the same image. So the Holy Spirit even though it's within, cannot walk until you behold. Because the spirit begins to walk when the believer begins to behold. And we said when the believer beholds, something happens. It becomes the physical, the manifest expression of everything the God on his inside is. This is when the believer becomes a living epistle. When he's able not just to host God, but to give expression to God. And if this truly begins to happen in your life, then in eternity, you become an entity of recognition. This is where I want to get into certain implications. Because most times, we listen to doctrines, we master them, but we don't know the implication. Most times, it's possible, especially for the youth, to assume that everything about life ends in time. Paul said, if only in this life we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. Life is a ticket and an opportunity given to us to invest in eternity. I told us how that everything we see in life is a lie. Your looks, you are 17 years old, you say you are a slave queen. Wait until you become 40. That face that you rub all the powders, that shines 
and glows like the sun. When you become 40, then you discover wrinkles appear from nowhere and you begin to wonder. You thought everything was about what you had and then suddenly the wind comes and blows everything away and you say, what is going on? Even time itself, you now realize it's a lie. So men that have understanding, they look to the hills from whence their help cometh because they have realized that life in itself can only be expressed in eternity. So eternity becomes their greatest motivation. This is why a man can give his body to be burnt. I was contemplating the justice system of heaven and I wondered why a family with one child and God will send that boy to Afghanistan and God knows because he's omniscient that this boy will be slaughtered in Afghanistan and he sends that boy to Afghanistan and the boy is slaughtered and I began to wonder what kind of justice is that? There are families that have 10 sons and don't know what to do with them. Why not pick one of them? And then I realized that the value of life itself is not in time. The man that God sends and runs his errand, what God is doing is actually favoring him because when true reality is made manifest, then he will realize that time would have been a lie apart from God. You reign, you ancient Zion king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion king. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. What then is the first implication of a living episode or being a living episode? Is God witnessing. Witnessing is not telling people about Jesus Christ. If you have not been on this path for long, you will assume witnessing is just to talk to people about God. <laughs> if you choose this path, then you understand the frustration that men are going through. What do you think? You tell a harlot that God loves you. And then all of a sudden, she changes from being a harlot. Witnessing is being able to bring God on the scene. It can be through your words. It can be through your lifestyle. But any believer that cannot bring God on the scene is not a witness. And if he's not a witness, he's not a living epistle. What is the implication? Without witnessing, there will be no proof that God is real. God is a lie except there are witnesses. Witnesses are the proof that what we call God and everything we say about him is real. There is no way you can see him. He dwells in the invisible realm. And he's not in a hurry to prove himself. Many came and said, if you are God, show yourself. He didn't answer them. The only way he can be proven that God is true and is real is when you and I become witnesses. So the first implication of being a living episode is to prove to this world that there is God. And that he is real and is alive. If men cannot see God through you, there's nowhere they will see him. So Paul speaking in 1 Corinthians 3 1, he said, Do we therefore begin to present ourselves as commendation letters to you? There's no point doing that. You yourselves are the proof that God is real. Many believers in our offices, in our schools, in our banks, in the society, nobody can see God through us. So even when we say, God, deal, the people say, yes, we know. You see somebody dying, you say, but God said this. You say, uh, I know. This is where religion was born from. Men could not present God, but they want to let the world know that God is real. So everybody is acting accordingly, but there's no life. And we are not only proving to the world about God, his will and his power. Witnessing is beyond men, is to all creation. In Job chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3 and chapter 1 from verse 6 to 9 Satan went to God. You don't know the politics that is going on up, 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 up in the spirit realm. So you don't know the implication of being a witness. Every one of us that is a witness is a spectacle on earth. Making statements beyond our understanding in the realm of the spirit. 
Satan went to Job. And the Bible said, there was a man in Oz from the side of the east. He said, it's a man that feared God and eschewed evil. Evil could not dwell within the borders of his habitation. His life was an expression of God. And Job came and said, Satan came to God and began to argue over Job. He said, I have moved through the whole earth. The earth is now my domain. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? That means the only legality that God had on earth at the, in the days of Job was the life of Job on earth. Satan came to make a boast to God that I have conquered the earth. The earth belongs to me now. I own it. And God said, have you seen my servant Job? So long as Job is still on earth, you don't own the earth. The power of witnessing. God is sovereign. The devil would have challenged him and successfully made a mockery of him. Except that there was something standing in between the devil and his challenge. Have you seen my servant Job? So the reason God was still sovereign in the days of Job was because Job was there. Without Job, the devil would have made a mockery of God. That's how important witnesses, witnessing is. Is it possible that God can come to Unica and the prince over this territory is bragging that I own this place. Anybody that comes there belongs to me. And then he goes to heaven to make a post. And there's nobody God can point at and say, so long as this man is here, that territory still belongs to me. The reason God has a stake on earth is because they are witnesses. The reason God has a stake in a family is because they are witnesses. When you come to a family, the devil buffets at will. is because there's no witness. This is why certain families, every three years, somebody dies. A devil is making a statement that I am God here. And when the devil is God, the Bible said, He cometh not but for kill, to steal, and to destroy. If you see a life that falls and rises, lived in iniquity, it means there is no witness. Sufficient witness is not there. Spirits are out to make a boast that they are dominating this realm. The physical creation, the visible creation is the realm of manifestation. Every spirit is making a boast and making, trying to have a stake in this realm. The only way a spirit can have a stake in this realm is when it has a representative and a functionary in this realm. The worship and memory of God will be lost from the earth, even though he's sovereign, unless there are witnesses. The stake God has on earth is you and I. The business of soul is too important because without it, spirits are insignificant. As mighty as God is, he will be insignificant on earth unless you and I represent him. That's the power of witnessing. But for you to be a witness of his spirit, you must have his life on your inside and express him. This is why talking about God is not the issue. And the spirits will prove you it's not something you just say and they say, okay, since you said so, let it be. <laughs> Job told God, God, Satan told God, he said, does Job fear you for nothing? That means you are, you are bribing Job to fear you. Job does not necessarily have your life. Job does not necessarily prove your existence. Job is just leeching on you. So he's not a witness. That's who most of us are. We come to God for bread, for breakthroughs, for job opportunities. So we are not necessarily representing God. We are only there to leech from his realm. And the devil came and said, take these things away. And you will discover that Job is not your representative. And God said, go ahead. What does a man do for God to make a boast of him? That's a man who is popular among the immortals. There are many of us that are popular among men. We have stature, we have rank among men. But in the spirit, there is no authority. Men that God can brag about, that have authority in the spiritual realm, are the men that God can, de can depend on, regardless of the issues on ground. Touch him! And the devil came and swept everything Job had. Job was immovable. And the devil was not enough, he came back. He says, skin for skin. If you touch his body, he will no longer be your witness. And God said, go and touch his flesh and touch his bone. Job chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3. What a boast. No wonder Paul said we have known God. He now corrected himself. He said no. 
we are known of God. A man that can prove God and comes to a point where he can stake his life, that's a man that is relevant in heaven. Some people, their relevance will end on earth. But certain people, their relevance begins from heaven. Even when this world comes to an end, they will still be significant. The Bible said, men will come from the north, the south, the east and the west to sit at the feet of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He was not only a star on earth, even in heaven, he was a ranking personality because of the quality of life he lived on earth. Will you end your journey on earth as a miserable man because you have no stake in heaven? The key is to become a witness. Because the princes will come to challenge you. Circumstances will come to challenge you. Will you still be standing? Because when you stand, then you prove to this world that God is still alive. When you stand, then everything you say about God becomes true. Everything you talk about God will be a lie unless you are able to stand in the face of crisis. That is a witness. Job's testament about God will be a lie except as in the face of challenge he stood his ground. So one of the ways of checking who truly is a witness is by trials. But you cannot pass through trials unless you have done business with the world. In Job 29 verse 4, he says, As I was in the days of my youth, when the secrets of God was upon my tabernacles. So it was by the secret of God. He said, by the secret of God, I walked through darkness. I put my feet in butter. When the candle of God was upon my head, and by light, I walked through darkness. He did business with the world until a point came when even the devil could not compromise him for what he stood for. So in all of eternity, the name of Job rang. The first book that was written in the Bible is the book of Job. Because the scriptures is a revelation of witness. God needed to reveal to us that our life itself has no value except as we can prove him. This is why men will die for the kingdom. And then you think they have lost, but in eternity say they receive the crown of life. Witnessing. The first implication of a living epistle. We can come and teach that we are living epistles and open all the scriptures and do the Bible study. The moment we step out of the church, the devil will come to check whether what we say we know it. You don't know it until you can prove it. You don't know it until you can experience it and communicate the same experience. It's easy to talk. Talk is cheap. Anybody can gather 10 scriptures. If you have a good concordance, you can gather 10 scriptures. Where you truly preach, is in the face of crisis. Joseph, a young man, loving the Lord and making decrees that his life depended on God until he was sold. And the Bible said in Psalm 105 verse 17, he said he sent a man before them. How God wishes to make boast of men who can witness for him. You think they were selling the guy to be a slave, but the Bible said what? He sent a man before them. So everything happening to Joseph were orchestrations of God because God wanted Joseph to stand somewhere and prove that he is king. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, whom they sold for a servant. His feet was bound with fetters until the time that the word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord tried him. They sold him. You would think, he would say, okay, since God did not defend me, if God was there, why did they sell me? The guy was in a strange land, but he feared the Lord. When Potiphar's wife came, he said, how can I commit this evil against God? You will stand up and say you are betrayed. A witness sees it as an honor when he dies for his king. For him, life in itself has no value, except as he can serve the will of the king. The Bible said concerning David, that after he served his generation, according to the will of God, he rested. So life is a summation of serving the will of the spirit of God eternal. A man who does not understand this will live for his appetite. And the Bible said him that liveth for pleasure is dead. Why he liveth? You may be breathing oxygen for 80 years, but you will not appear in the radar of heaven. When they look for you, you will not be found. Because the only signature you have in eternity is the quality of your witness. The first implication of a living episode is the ability to be a witness for God. That ability is what will keep the devil quiet in this world. When you see the devil shouting and bragging in the life of a man or in a territory is because witness is insufficient. When witnesses rise, the devil becomes silent. God doesn't fight with the devil. It is witnesses that defend the integrity of God before the devil. 
Second implication of a witness. You may not understand the, the implication of these things for the young people, but if you want to be relevant in eternity, shift your priorities away a bit from those powders, from those wivons, from those suits and those cardigans. Shift your priorities away a bit. If not, when you show up in heaven, you will be amazed. These things have eternal implication because we have judged that life in itself has no value in time except as there is a record in heaven. Second implication is that living epistles are the house of God. You know, Paul came by the spirit of revelation in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9. And he said, we are God's husbandry. We are God's building. When you read it at face value, you may think it's just a theological statement. I got studying the scriptures. And I saw something that altered my priorities forever. The Bible said in Revelation chapter 21, from verse 1 to 3, and he began to speak about John. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. I didn't know the implication of that statement. Verse 3. He said, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Go to verse 11. I didn't understand the implication. Talking about the same city, he said, Having the glory of God and her light was like unto stones most precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Go down. He said, And had war great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Go down. Go down again to verse 14. He said, And the war of the city had twelve foundations. And in them, the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the Holy Ghost began to speak to me. That was when I understood what Paul meant when he said we are God's building. Anyone that is not walked on in this world will not be a part of that city. I saw that the apostles of the Lamb, everything they did for God in time, became a signature in that city. So they became part of the foundation of that city. That means the new Jerusalem is not a block. It's people. So a man whose life is not committed to God on earth. In perpetual service. Will not be part of that building. He said the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb were on the foundation. That means they were the signature and the foundation of the new Jerusalem. So when Paul said we are God's building. Paul was talking about a literal structure, but in the spirit. And I understood why Peter would say in first in first, first Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Now he said, We are lively stones. We are lively stones. So every time the word of the Lord comes to you and tries you, and God chisels things out of your life, what God is actually doing is shaping you so that you can fit into that beauty. So it's possible for a man to live on earth the way he wants and refuse God chiseling him. Refuse to walk in the will of the Father. What he doesn't know is that he is refusing to be part of the new Jerusalem because he will have no place to fit into that structure. When you see this structure, the reason the structure have many shapes is because the builders took time. Some of them were cut into half. 
and half was thrown away. It's only half that could enter the building. So for them, for that block to be part of the building, half must be cut off. For that block to be part of the building, certain things must happen. The block that is in the foundation most time is toughened. More cement goes into it because of where he, it will be in the building. So I now saw why the dealings of God are different for us. Somebody else receives God and in three years he's everywhere. Another person, God keeps him without being known for 12 years. I didn't know that God was actually building. So the quality of our soul becomes the blocks that forms the infrastructure of the new Jerusalem. So you can live in this world and die at the age of 90, but you have no place in Zion. We are lively stones. He said in Isaiah 28 verse 16, he said, I lay in Zion a tried stone, a cornerstone, a precious stone. He now said, they that believe will not make haste. So the second implication of being a lively stone is that you are the blocks with which God is building the city that will come in the life hereafter. A man who refuses the dealing of God upon his life, a man who refuses the workings of the word of God in his spirit, he may think he's been sparked on earth, but when Zion appears, he will have no place. So these subject matters, they are deeper than time. They are realities of eternity. You wouldn't know why. You have come to church. You have heard the word of the Lord and it's sweet. And when he enters your belly, it becomes bitter. Because you heard how that God loves you. But you now go into the systems of the world. Because you say you will stand for truth. Everybody begins to fight you. Suddenly they slash your salary. Suddenly they send you from the city center into the village. And then you are wondering, God, where are you? What God is doing is that he's building a house. He is bringing you into a structure that will stand for eternity. But the only way your, your toughness and your resilience can be verified is when the word of the Lord tries you. So for truth, many were killed. For truth, many were sent away from places of prosperity. And they lived in pain and poverty all their lives. On earth, they may be irrelevant, but in Zion, the Bible says they are part of the new Jerusalem. In fact, the Bible said the wall of that city glitters like jasper stone. So those people become like the very reflectors of God. They are not just part of a structure. That structure becomes a reflection of God. Those times when they went through that process, what they did not realize was that God was shaping them so that they can fit into different corners of the building. And by ordination, every one of us fit into different locations. The blocks may be many, but when the building begins, some enters the foundation, some enters the roof, some enters the corner. By ordination, we have different places to fit in. And the Holy Ghost will come to chisel us until we are able to enter into those different dimensions to form that building that will be a witness of the new earth that cometh from Zion. So when God deals with a man, it's not a time to cry. It's a time to give thanks. That is why he said, Abraham staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. They made a mockery of him. He had no child. The wife had no child. And then God comes and says, he did not only promise him. He said, now go and tell everybody that I am the father of many nations. What a mockery. You are there. Things are going wrong. And God is telling you to go and make certain declarations. And people are laughing. All the money you save for one year, God now say, donate it for this project. I wanted to buy a car. What you don't know is that God is building a city with foundation whose builder and maker is God. <laughs> we are lively stones. We are not just mere mortars. There is a place we need to stand in Zion. But whether we will stand there or not depends on what God does to us and the degree of our yieldedness to his spirit. This is where texture comes into Christianity. You can be preaching, the whole world knows you, you're on TV and you're on ev everywhere. And suddenly God shows up and says, go to the village. Nobody captures you anymore. You were talking to 10,000 people, now your congregation is 300. Sometimes your congregation becomes 10 or 15. And then you come to church, you are like, what kind of thing is this? Every first of every month, 
a seed will land in your account because there was a senator in your church. Now God tells you go to the village. I want you to provide witness. But a man who does not understand that God is building the house, he will remain in the city because he thinks relevance is in time. But when we begin to discern Zion correctly, something happens. We turn and face the Lord. This is why the Bible will say Moses, when he was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the pleasures of Egypt, which is for a season. You may not know how hard these things are. When God chooses a man, he doesn't kill him, he's alive. He said we are living sacrifice. You are there. God tells you to go and apologize. That's the hardest thing to do. You are older. You are more influential, but he say apologize. What he's trying to do is to remove that excess, that, that oblong dimension of that block because there is somewhere that block cannot fit into. Living epistles. Stories that God is telling from heaven. And the only way it could be captured is that we are lively stones. When God makes a stone out of a man, even the devil can't challenge him anymore because he has been chiseled. There is nowhere to hold. Jesus said, this, The prince of this world cometh to me and findeth nothing. Why? The Bible said, In the beginning was the world. He first of all gave us a robust citation about Jesus. The world was with God. The world was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything that was made that was made. Three very heightened recognition. One, he was the, in the beginning with God. Two, the creator of all things. Three, he is God. And then this same Jesus that you call creator, that you call God, that you call being in the beginning, you now tell him to go to Jordan publicly and kneel down before John the Baptist. Chisney. This is why he's the author and finisher of our faith. Chisney. The reason why many marriages don't work is because people don't know that they are lively stones. The man comes to say, I'm the head of this house. Meanwhile, God say, apologize, but I am the head of this house. <laughs> The woman, ah, no, he's wrong, he's wrong. God said, knee down, like Sarah, and call him Lord. They say, no, it can't happen. So the family scatters. Nothing God builds will ever work unless men become lively stones. This is why our families will fail. Because we don't know the intelligence of becoming lively stones. He tells the man to love his wife as God loved the church. How is it possible? That means your affection for your wife is not emotional. It's the love of his spirit. The only way you can know how it works is when you see how it is done in the spirit realm. Even your parents' advice will not work. You must do it the way God depicted it through Jesus Christ. The love of his spirit. That's when sometimes you come home and God say, knee down. And you say, I am the head of the family. The family will break. Because what you call a family is an institution that God created from the spirit. And only by spiritual dictates can he find expression. But only lively stones understand the intelligence of building. We cannot build until we allow God to chisel us. Until we allow ourselves to become stones that the builder can do anything he wants to do upon. This is why in life we are not called to be creative. We are called to be yielded. The creative one is the Messiah. Sometimes he allows you, you are talking as a child. Then you came to an age and he said, no more talking. He is the one who is allowed to be creative. Because you don't know the part of the building you fit in. Have you seen a block that said before I want to be at the foundation? It is not given to you. It says it's not given to man that walketh to order his steps. You want to be eternally relevant? You must become a stone. Lively stones. The reason why we can't move forward even though we know so much is because we are not stones. Men that cannot be tried, they want to handle glory. Say when God shall build up Zion, that is only when he can appear in his glory. Every man God ever walked with, there was a chiseling process. Many cried. And then they thought God will show mercy. That is when the mercy of God is lost. Because he wants you to be eternally relevant. He will cut off that oblong head until you become part of his specification. He will wipe up that your shoulder that you carry like this. Because you need to fit into somewhere. And the space is not very large. The space is narrow. You are too big. You cannot enter. So he will cut off your feet. That your eye that beholds evil, he will cut it off. <laughs> lively stones. The reason the principalities are strong in the territory is because we are not lively stones. We come to talk about a God that does not have authority over us. Kadosh, Kadosh, 
you are mighty on your throne. Because you have a good voice. You prepare on Sunday with high heat and very elegant gown. Then you are singing. You think God is impressed with your voice. If it's based on voice, he would have allowed only angels to worship him. That person that refused the chiseling of God, he thinks he's coming to worship God. Worship is not singing. It begins with a life of obedience. <laughs> this is why we sing, nothing happens. This is why we shout, nothing happens. Even when we pray, nothing happens. Because we are not lively stones. Our voices doesn't resonate in Zion. We are only known on earth. So our prayer now is a function of volume. Father! Nothing happens. When a lively stone thinks about God, things happen. When a lively stone whispers, heaven can move on his account. I am the Lord that confirmed the wars of my servants and performed the counsel of my messenger. Except they don't talk. The moment they alter their voice, their voice becomes like the sound of many waters. Even the principalities will bow. Living epistles is not a doctrine. It's more of a consecrated life. What can God do with you? What can God do with you? It is the extent to which God can work on you that will determine your relevance, not what you know about God. We are out of time. <laughs> I would have talk, spoken to you about spiritual authority as being superior to the anointing. The reason why people fall in church but their life is not changed in the territory is because we have anointing, we don't have authority. Meanwhile, the business of colonization is a business of authority, not anointing. The devil was in heaven, most anointed of the angels, but he knew that for him to have government and authority, he needed to ascend the throne. Even though he was most anointed, the Bible said, he was the revelation of beauty and glory. He said, from the day of your creation, he said, you were covered with the finest stones, jasper, topaz, gold, sapphire, kabunko. He was clothed, he was shining like the sun. He said, you walk in the midst of the coals of fire. You were in Eden from the day of thy creation. Thy taps and thy tablets were in thee. The guy knew the emotions of God so much that if God wanted to laugh, he knew what to do. If he shakes his body, heaven is saturated with sound. Different kinds of sound that communicated the emotions of God. The Bible said, you are the anointed cherub that covered it. So he was both a cherubim, he was also a seraphim. Cherubims are the ones that, caught, that guard the jealousy of God's glory. Seraphims, they are the ones that keep the holiness of God moving in the coals of fire. The devil was both moving in the coal of fire and he was both a covering for the glory of God. But he knew that anointing cannot colonize a territory. Meanwhile, in our generation, we celebrate anointing. But there are no men of stature. The same people that come to church, they are the same people in the nightclubs. The same people we preach to on the crusade ground, they are the same people that are killing and doing all kinds of evil. Because we cannot talk to their heart. We only talk to their head. Because even ourselves, there is no government. Jesus said, for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they too might be sanctified. The prince of this world, come to me and find that nothing. That's a lively stone. That's a living epistle. When he talks to you, you have no choice. He saw a tax collector. In the days of old, the tax collector is like one that walks in Chevron. He said, follow me. And the guy abandoned his job. He saw fishermen with their parents. He said, follow me. They abandoned their net. That's not a man talking. It's a lively stone. That's a living epistle. Every time he speaks, you hear the voice of God through him. But it begins with government. Suffer it to be so for now. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. So the creator went down to be baptized by creation. Many of us cannot bow. We are too strong in ourselves. How can you walk for God when you are strong? That's why we have no authority. The devil will come to your family and steal your family members. You cry, you say, God, why? Meanwhile, you are the priest of that family. But there is no authority. Because when God wanted to deliver that family, that was when he came to you and said, stop fornicating. You didn't know that stop fornicating is not just holy living. It will confer authority on you and preserve your family. When God came and said, stop lying, you don't know that that is the life of your elder brother. I was living carelessly. God will come to me and say, pray at night. I thought it was a, a, it was a religious act. Pray at night. I kept quiet for six years. And in six years, my mother and my brother were killed. Until I realized that something was wrong. 
And when I began to obey, the same witch came from my father. And then God told me, I'm now a gatekeeper. I did not only stop the situation, I killed the witch. And he confessed before dying. He said he killed my brother. So those days when God was telling me, wake up and pray at night, it was my brother's life he was bargaining. But I was not wise. He was bargaining my brother's life with me. He was bargaining my brother's destiny. He was bargaining my brother's future. I thought it was about sleeping and praying. I didn't know that life depended on it. My father too would have gone. Because I think it's about luxury and sleep. So now, from 10 to 12, everything you do, you keep your energy because you need to wake up at night. Because life depends on it. This is where authority is born. There are many people that the destiny of a territory is in their hands. But they think that um, they need to have that girlfriend. They think it's about girlfriend. They don't know that that consecration God is bringing upon their life is to save a generation. It is when you commit to it that something now happens to your voice. God puts authority there. So when you scream, the princes in darkness will run away. He said the land of Zebulun. Matthew chapter 4 verse 16. The land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. Light was not because it was a lie. It was because he went to John and said, suffer it to be so for now. It's because the Holy Ghost led him into the wilderness to be tempted and he followed. So when he came out from dealing, he became a light. Most of you, your brothers, your sisters, your fathers will die unless you rise up. The significance of lively stones, the significance of being a living epistle is beyond talking about God. It's bringing God on the scene. But this is where many cannot walk. So our Christian life is reduced to religion. Let's bow our heads and pray. That God may help us by his mercies to become a witness so that our life will prove the existence of God. That we will become lively stones and become part of the eternal buildings that is raising in Zion. And that we will become men of authority that we advance his purpose on the face of the earth the purpose of God on earth will die unless men of authority rise our life on earth will be a waste unless we become lively stones that will be part of the building in heaven and God will never be accepted on earth unless we truly become witnesses the significance of a living epistle you ask the Lord to help your heart now Maybe you have been in church for 5 years, for 1 year, for 10 years, for 20 years and you did not understand that being a witness is beyond talking about God. Being a witness is proving in your office that God is real. And not just that God is real, that he has a purpose, he has a will, he has a government. Maybe you did not know that being a witness is also the only ticket you have to be relevant in Zion. And maybe you did not know also that the purpose of God on earth will never be accomplished unless you become a witness. I see many people that stand on Facebook and on media insulting pastors. They are funny people. They don't know it's not the job of a pastor to bring the will of God to the earth. It's the job of every believer. We are the ones to do the work of the ministry. It has nothing to do with the pastor. But there are no lively stones. Adosh Elohim Adonai Elohim We worship you most high Kadosh, Kadosh Do Kadosh Elohim Adonai Elohim We worship Next time God puts in your heart to bring that money to church, know that it's not you doing the church a favor. Know that it's you securing a place for yourself in Zion. Next time God tells you to speak to that sinner, know that it's not you just bringing salvation to that sinner. It is you bringing God into this world. And next time God gives you an assignment, an instruction, know that it's you walking into the womb of spiritual authority.
I hope you enjoyed this video and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video, and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.